What's your name? I tested it.
The committee will come to order. Today, millions of Americans are able to get access to quality health care right in their home because of advancements and new flexibilities implemented by hospitals, hospitals and doctors for, for the patients they treat. Over 3.2 million patients across America chose to receive infusion therapy at home. One in four adults use telehealth every month and nearly 50 million Americans use some sort of remote monitoring service. These technologies are helping providers coordinate care across different health settings and bring quality care from your doctor's office and even hospital to your living room. The results show that at-home care can be better for patients, health, and wallets. At-home dialysis has been a game changer for patients. Those patients have a 40% lower mortality rate and they recover faster than those treated at a physical dialysis center. At-home infusion can cost up to 60% less than infusion performed in a hospital or doctor's office. Not surprisingly, at-home care is massively popular with patients. More than 90% of Medicare Advantage enrollees using telehealth have a favorable opinion. Over 90% are satisfied with their remote patient monitoring care and assistance. Where someone lives, works, or raises a family should not be a barrier to getting top of the line health care. One of our priorities on this committee is helping every American get health care in their community. For patients in rural and underserved communities, bringing health care home is a lifesaver. These communities struggle with access to health care, which results in worse health outcomes compared to wealthy urban areas. Americans living in small towns often have fewer health services close by, and rural Americans have to drive farther to get critical care. We're already seeing these patients take advantage of care at home options. Rural ESRD patients, for example, are 22% more likely to receive dialysis at home compared with their urban counterparts. Audio-only telehealth increases access for rural and underserved Americans who lack reliable internet. In the 28 counties I represent back in Missouri, there are plenty of spots that have bad internet. You can forget about a Zoom call with your doctor. And I know I'm not the only person on this committee who can say that. We're here to discuss the benefits of these advancements for our constituents, while recognizing that the Medicare telehealth and hospital at home flexibilities that make at-home care possible are both set to expire at the end of this year. The consequences of these policies expiring would wreak havoc for patients and doctors now accustomed to providing care at home. Medicare patients would no longer be able to receive telehealth care from home, and patients receiving hospital at home care will have to go back to the hospital, limiting bed availability for other patients. Doctors and providers will yet again face more uncertainty and be left scrambling to figure out the best way to take care of these patients. At the same time, we cannot accept the same tired approaches that have not made a meaningful difference for enough patients. Before today's hearing, I had the chance, along with members of the committee, to see some of the cutting edge technology that could help better address the unique needs of rural and underserved communities and expand access to care through innovation. We have to explore new approaches that have the potential to help make Americans healthier and allow rural Americans to get care when and where they need it. Home dialysis, infusions, and remote patient monitoring can be better utilized by investing in patient assistance and examining provider reimbursement. Additionally, meaningful patient and taxpayer protections should be considered to ensure robust access, demonstrate value, and prevent waste, fraud, and abuse. Importantly, health at home should be considered a supplement to quality in-person care. Hospitals and doctor's offices are and will always remain critical pieces of our healthcare system that millions of patients rely on, and we are happy to have their support in leveraging this new technology. Still, Congress must help patients 
who want more control and flexibility over their health care, especially those with chronic conditions or living in rural and remote areas. I look forward to working with my colleagues to find ways we can pr preserve and protect health at home options that, that serve families and seniors across our country. I'm pleased to recognize the ranking member, Mr. Nill, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this is a good opportunity, I think, for a pretty good hearing to discuss a series of challenging issues. But I also want to thank the work of uh, House Democrats who have reached historic health care milestones that continue to improve the lives of the American people. More Americans have health insurance today than ever before, with four out of five people now being able to access high-quality care for less than $10 a month. The American people have trusted us when it comes to protecting their access to health care and for good and obvious reasons. This committee is the birthplace of those sacred promises that were made to the American people. And Ways and Means Democrats will not back down from defending the economic security and peace of mind that we have given to workers and retirees from political threats. I never miss the opportunity in quiet moments here to reflect upon one portrait on the wall to my left in which Mr. Mills, who was the chairman of the committee from Arkansas, embraced the idea of Medicare. Even though his enthusiasm was limited at the beginning when Lyndon Johnson got done, his enthusiasm was necessary to get the legislation over the goal line, always recalling that Medicare is an amendment to the Social Security Act. And as President Biden noted the other night, there will be no changes on his watch to the guarantee of these initiatives. While today's hearing is an important look at the emerging forms of health care, we want to make sure that there are no efforts that will would dismantle the ACA or the health care system as we've improved it. Home-based health care played a key role in connecting Americans with medical care during COVID-19 and the pandemic. The celebration of that famous statement from Dr. Fauci was yesterday. It continues to be a point of focus for policymakers, and more services are being offered today at home. As we examine the current use and potential expansion of home care-based services, this committee must consider how these services impact patient outcomes, health equity, taxpayers, and caregivers, and implement data-driven solutions that promote value for beneficiaries. I have actually participated in home, home health care visits with advocates. What we pay for and how we pay for it will affect patients' costs and access to care for the foreseeable future. Promoting health equity is, in home-based services is a priority for our proposals to expand Medicare. Current infrastructure weaknesses make it impossible for rural and underserved communities to rely on telehealth and other home-based care alone. Democrats delivered a generational investment in our nation's infrastructure with the bipartisan infrastructure law, and we now must continue to make sure that Internet access is available to all members of the American family that will connect rural and underserved communities with access to home-based health care. Caregivers must also be at the center of this policy discussion. We have more than 48 million family caregivers in America, too many of whom find it difficult, if not impossible, to coordinate health care for their loved ones. While care in the home can help caregivers in coordinating care, care in the home can also rely on already overburdened caregivers as they must attend to their loved ones' daily needs. Four years ago, as I noted to the day, we were locked down in a great state of uncertainty. The following months consisted of heartbreak that took too many lives and stretched our health care system like never before. All while we ignored the science, some ignored the science and put millions of lives in danger. When Joe Biden took office, that life returned to normal. We did what was needed to get done in terms of shots in the arms and millions of people went back to work in record time and ultimately put the health and well-being of the American people first. His progress and promises continue to be outstanding, and we certainly do not intend to go back. I'm grateful for the witnesses for being here today. They are well chosen, and we look forward to hearing their testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Neal. I will now introduce our witnesses. Belle Maddox is a home dialysis patient and a working mother. Roy Underhill is a hospital at home patient. And Dr. Nathan Starr is a medical doctor and lead, lead hospitality hospitalist of tele of telehospitalist program for Intermountain Healthcare. Chris Altchek is founder and CEO of Cadence and Dr. Ativ Marotra is professor of healthcare policy and medicine at Harvard Medical School um, at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. 
Thank you for joining us today. Your written statements will be made part of the hearing record, and you each have five minutes to deliver remarks. Ms. Maddox, you may begin. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to testify before this committee today. My name is Belle Maddox, and I am a home hemodialysis patient. Currently, I live with my husband and my two children in Tobihanna, Pennsylvania, which is a lovely rural area in the Pocono Mountains. I was diagnosed with kidney disease as a teenager, and in 2008, I was fortunate to receive a living kidney donation from my father. That kidney lasted me 10 years and allowed me the amazing gift of becoming a mom. However, in 2018, despite 10 years of good health, perfect labs, perfect blood pressure, I started experiencing signs of kidney rejection. I was standing on West 4th Street in New York on my way to work when my nephrologist called from her vacation and yelled through a bad connection that I needed to get to the emergency room immediately. From that point, my health plummeted, I was unable to eat, and my weight went down to a number I hadn't seen since I was about 12 years old. At that time, we were living in Newburgh, New York, which is about an hour outside of New York City. And for four months, I struggled making my daily commute into the city to work. I would drive to the train station, then take the train to the subway. But by the time I got to my last subway transfer, I could only take a few steps at a time without having to rest on a subway support beam. Once at work, I found it difficult to have enough strength to stay in my chair all day. And I would often find a back room where I could do my work laying on the floor. Dialysis had been a long-standing fear of mine, but now it was time to start. And before my first treatment, I sat in my car outside of the dialysis clinic and struggled to breathe. But I went in and I began my life as a dialysis patient. And once I felt the effects of it, I realized how much I needed it to function in my day to day. Three days a week, I sat in a chair for three hours straight while the, kit, while the machine, dialysis machine did 17% of the work that my kidneys should have been doing continuously. The clinic was only five minutes away from my house, but my life quickly became dominated by getting to and doing treatment. Every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, I had to arrive at around 1.30 to prepare for a 2 p.m. chair time. And by the time I left, it was about 5.30. Saturdays when my family were completely gone and things like birthday parties and soccer matches, I, I just had to miss. I'm thankful that my company allowed me to work from home on those two days so I could bring my laptop with me to continue working during my chair time. I did wanna maintain my, my 15 year career as a digital project manager, but I also wanted to be valuable to my team. But participating in client calls and team meetings became impossible with machine alarms constantly beeping and frustrated patients in distress. It was, difficult, it was a difficult place to be for so many reasons. Many of the other patients had mobility issues and relied on medical transport services to bring them from their home, which could sometimes be 45 minutes away. One very kind man told me at one point that he did nothing else in his life except go to dialysis and then wait to go to dialysis. I didn't know much about home dialysis at that time, but being already overwhelmed with two small children and failing health, I was reluctant to take on any added responsibility. But clinic life had become too difficult. My doctor explained that doing more frequent treatments would be easier on my body, and I would get some relief from the physical symptoms that I had been experiencing. So I went to the floor nurse and I asked for an appointment with the home training nurse, and they all seemed excited, gave me a few folders and papers to read, uh, but then I heard nothing for a few weeks. Follow-up calls from me and my doctor got no response, and finally the scheduled appointments that I had made was made during the nurse's vacation. I was also trying to coordinate a move from New York to a larger home in Tobihanna, Pennsylvania, but I was getting nowhere with making this transition. My doctor was equally frustrated and handed me the private cell phone number of a home dialysis nurse at another center. My new nurse took care of everything, including training me how to insert the 15 gauge needles into my own arm, how to rotate the needle positions to avoid damaging my access, how to draw and process my own blood for labs, and how to administer my own medication. After the first week, my energy was up, my symptoms eased, my diet and fluid struggles disappeared. I even got comments on the improvement in the pallor of my skin. So today I do my dialysis treatments at home and my entire day is free every day. 
After I make dinner, I take 10 minutes to set up the machine, I lay out my supplies, then I can do a quick bath time and bedtime stories with my kids and even squeeze in a quick tidy up before I take my vitals, settle in with my electric blanket and a movie. Now I can choose to do my work during treatment or I can choose to do my treatment after work. When I'm done, I can be pretty wiped out still, but instead of getting behind the wheel of my car, I can take three steps and get in my bed. It also means that my free time is no longer devoted to preparing for or recovering from treatment. I do still travel two hours twice a week to my office in New York City, but now thanks to home dialysis, I have the energy for the long commute and also for the long workday after. My initial perception of being on home, a home dialysis patient was not wrong. It is a lot of work. It is not without risks and it's not for everyone, but the benefits are so much that I think every person who's on dialysis should be empowered with the choice and armed with the su support and sufficient information to make the right choice for themselves. My younger son doesn't remember me ever being in clinic, but my daughter remembers wishing I did not have to go all the time, and they both prefer to have me at home. Having that choice is second only to having a working kidney. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Underhill is recognized. Uh, good morning, Chairman Smith, uh, Ranking Member Neal, and members of the committee. My name is Roy Underhill, and I've traveled here today from Saxapahaw, North Carolina, where I've lived with my wife uh, <laughs> in an old mill on Cane Creek for about 15 years. Our nearest neighbors are wood ducks, bobcats, and river otters. My primary occupation is studying and teaching about early American woodworking. I'm honored to be here today with you, and uh, thank you for inviting me to testify at today's hearing on enhancing health care at home in our rural and underserved communities. Now, one landmark of our old mill where I live is the dam and waterfall of, of the mill pond. Throughout 2021, I had been suffering with urinary blockage from prostate enlargement, and I assure you that the aggravation of urinary blockage is not enhanced by the constant sound of a waterfall by your house. Resorting to a urinary catheter for relief, I apparently induced an E. coli infection into the works. This infection began to spread, and on a Sunday evening, November 7th, 2021, I began feeling waves of chills and trembling. My temperature was climbing, and I was sweating profusely. I became disoriented, verging on delirious, and my wife, Jane, managed to get me into the car and drove me to the emergency room over in Chapel Hill as fast as she could. Unfortunately, this was also the evening of a football game in Chapel Hill, and the emergency room was packed with students suffering from alcohol-related mishaps and malaise. It was also the high time of COVID, and which added significantly to the crowd. I was eventually diagnosed with sepsis, a potentially deadly situation where the bacterial infection had spread throughout my body. They began treatment with intravenous antibiotics, and the doctor told me that I came close, but I was not going to die, information I was greatly reassured by. He said my course of treatment would require a hospital stay of at least three days, but there was an alternative, a new program where I could continue treatment at home rather than in the hospital if I qualified. Well, I enthusiastically expressed my desire to pursue this option, and they began the questions regarding the suitability of my home for this new program. Once they determined that I qualified, they dispatched a team out to my home where they began installing the technical equipment that I would need to stay connected to my care team at the hospital. They prepared a downstairs bedroom with a wireless connection to the hospital, a direct phone line, an emergency button, and a dedicated visual link. All of this was installed on the bedside tables of my bedroom. When I returned home from the hospital that afternoon, all this equipment was in place and the medical staff was there to explain the equipment and show me how to work it. I learned how to pull up my schedule for each day and how to operate all the equipment. 
I slept very well that night with my pets and my books and my own bed with my bedclothes, my own. And the next day, neighbors and friends were able to stop by and bring me chicken soup. Now, they would not have been able to visit had I been in the hospital. Twice or more a day, medical professionals drop by on their rounds through the countryside to check my vitals and administer the continuing antibiotic treatment. I saw my doctors, nurses, and, and paramedics, both in person and virtually, at least several times a day, and received all the medical services I needed. At any time, I could check in through the video link at the doctors and nurses and make sure that I was recovering as expected. I credit this hospital at home option with much of the excellent results of my treatment and recovery, as well as the absence of any dangerous complications that might occur from hospital-induced infections. The program freed up a hospital bed for those who might need it more, and I was happy at home in my own room and Jane's home cooking. The program worked great for me, and thinking of my other rural neighbors, uh, it's an option that I'm sure could do a lot of good for a lot of folks. For me, it was great. I, I do like old tools and techniques, but when it comes to healthcare, I am a big fan of the 21st century. I hope you can find a way to keep this excellent program going. Thank you for providing me with the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to any questions you might have later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Starr, you are now recognized. Chairman Smith and Ranking Member Neal and members of the committee, my name is Dr. Nathan Starr, and I am an internal medicine physician with Intermountain Health. As part of my role, I am medical director of home services, which includes our hospital at home and our home-based primary care programs. I also direct our telehospitalist program, which involves providing virtual care for patients in rural hospitals. Intermountain Health is the largest healthcare provider in the Intermountain West, covering seven states, including a large rural presence within our own footprint, as well as providing telehealth services in many rural communities outside of our footprint. Intermountain views moving care away from hospitals as essential to our mission of helping people live the healthiest lives possible. A key element of that shift is increasing the provision of care in the home. The directive I received from our CEO, Rob Allen, about our hospital at home program was to simply grow. In 2020, we stood up a hospital at home program as fast as we could in response to the pandemic. There are two ways that patients enter our program. They're admitted from the emergency department to home, or there are patients who are transferred home to complete their hospitalization following an admission. Taking care of patients for the last four years in their homes has dramatically changed how I view healthcare. In a hospital or clinic, we only get a snapshot of the patient, while being in the home allows us to truly understand them. We have many patient successes within our program, and for the sake of time, I refer you to my written testimony to see those examples. And I greatly appreciate the two examples that have been shared with us today. With our focus on value-based care, Intermountain plans on investing heavily in moving care to patients' communities and homes, guided by five principles. First, the care we give must be of equal or better quality than what the patient would receive at the hospital. Second, the patient experience must be at least as good, if not better. Third, we must show that we have cost savings that make this financially beneficial for the hospital, health system, payer, and the patient. Fourth, these programs must improve the working experience of our employees and providers, especially an opportunity with nurses. We can help them stay in healthcare and utilize their expertise in a way that prevents burnout and provides growth. For us, the experience has been so positive that our healthcare, for our healthcare providers that we have a waiting list to work in our teleprograms. Lastly, we need to ensure that we are providing needed care, not extra care. At Intermountain, we have provided hospital at home care to more than 1,200 patients, have had zero serious in-home safety events, have seen lower hospital readmissions, fantastic patient experiences, 
and have freed up over 4,000 physical patient bed days. We are just beginning to scratch the surface of what we can do in the home and in communities. For example, in addition to hospital at home, we provide virtual nighttime hospitalists and 24-hour intensive care support in rural communities. We provide virtual teleoncology services in rural communities. And my written testimony contains many more examples. Lastly, today is the grand opening of a hybrid community health clinic that combines telehealth and in-person services in Wells, Nevada, a town of 1,200 people with the closest health care prior to this clinic, a round trip of 100 miles. On behalf of Intermountain Health and the Moving Health Home Alliance to which we belong, we urge you to pass the Expanding Care at Home Act introduced by Ways and Means Committee member Congressman Adrian Smith and Congresswoman Debbie Dingell. This legislation, H.R. 2853, will remove barriers that currently limit our ability to care for patients in the home. We also urge a five-year extension of the current waivers to the Acute Hospital Care at Home Initiative. This will allow the needed time to gather data to develop a permanent regulatory, clinical, and financial model that will make hospital at home a success for everyone. If Congress fails to act to extend the hospital at home program, we will be forced to roll back the program and lose the important gains we have made. What makes me so passionate and excited about moving care into the home is if we do this right, then hospitals, health systems, communities, payers, and most importantly, patients will all win. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Mr. Altchuk, Altchuk you are now recognized. Thank you, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Neal, and dis distinguished members of the committee. I'm honored to speak with you today on a bipartisan topic, how we find solutions to the dramatic access challenges affecting patients and families living in rural and underserved communities. My name is Chris Altchuk founder and CEO of Cadence, one of the nation's leading providers of remote monitoring for patients living with chronic conditions. We currently monitor patients from home across 20 states, including nearly 12,000 patients in rural and underserved communities. My written testimony details the research showing how remote monitoring delivers better clinical outcomes and lower costs. I want to start with how remote monitoring works and why it matters so much to patients and their families. If you have ever supported a family member following a hospitalization, you likely struggled with confusing printed instructions and a laundry list of medications. If you have helped a family member with type 2 diabetes, you know how hard it is to titrate their insulin. Many of your constituents are frustrated because clinics are too far away, they can't get in to see their doctors, and when they finally get appointments, they're rushed. The vast majority of Americans are facing these challenges. At Cadence, we use technology to make it easy for patients to get better care. Patients are monitored by our clinical team from home 24-7. With easy-to-use devices, patients transmit their vitals, sharing blood pressure, heart rate, blood glucose, and weight daily. Our care team is automatically alerted when a patient needs intervention. For example, their weight increased rapidly, indicating an impending heart failure exacerbation, or their blood pressure is too low, indicating a serious infection. Cadence gets in touch proactively, quickly prescribes medications, orders labs, and schedules in-person appointments with their local physicians we work for. This kind of swift intervention frequently prevents health issues from progressing to ER visits, hospitalizations, and even long-term disability or death. A patient with hypertension in Arkansas recently transmitted a high blood pressure of 190 early in the evening, putting them at risk for a serious event such as a stroke. Our clinicians immediately got in touch with the patient and spoke to the patient's adult child caregiver. We made a plan for medication change, continued monitoring overnight, and avoided an ED visit. The caregiver was grateful to have Cadence there, providing peace of mind. In our country, we have the ability to significantly mitigate the impact of chronic disease. But systemically, we struggle to implement relatively simple interventions. Heart failure patients' lives could be prolonged by five years on average by adherence to the right medications. However, less than 1.5% of these patients are even prescribed the recommended doses following hospitalizations. Our system is not set up for success. Doctors don't have frequent enough vitals to make appropriate change, and even if they have the vitals, 
they don't have the time. Cadence's job is to fill in the gap. Another example, the management of diabetes. The wife of one of our patients in Alabama with type 2 recently said that we saved her marriage. Before, she was constantly arguing with her husband about monitoring his blood sugar and is watching his diet. Now, every time he checks his blood glucose, it transmits automatically to his doctor and Cadence. Together, we keep him accountable in real time. His A1C is decreasing for the first time in years. Our written testimony shows that technology and an innovative care model can deliver superior outcomes at lower costs, especially in rural and underserved communities. Our data shows that remote monitoring more than pays for itself, with a 23% decrease in total cost. Members of this committee, you play a critical role in determining whether modern health care becomes broadly accessible. I urge you to consider two important policy solutions. First, please fix regional payment disparities that penalize rural communities. Reimbursement is lowest in the communities that need it most. Missouri remote monitoring pays 33% lower than remote monitoring in San Francisco. The old way, adjusting Medicare payments by geography, doesn't make sense in a technology-enabled system. Devices, connectivity, staff, all have the same cost regardless of location. It's an important change to an unintended policy. Second, please ensure national payment rates stay in line with Medicare. Remote monitoring rates have declined up to 28% since being introduced in 2018, substantially more than Medicare rates. I encourage policymakers to look at the data and decide what kind of healthcare future we want for our country. Thank you for your time. I appreciate your focus on these important issues. Thank you. Dr. Marotra, you are now recognized. Thank you, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Neal, um, and other distinguished members of the committee. I'm honored to testify before you today on a topic of such importance to Americans and their health. I conduct research on telehealth and remote patient monitoring because I'm excited about how these technologies can address the complaint I often hear from my patients and what I'm sure you hear from your constituents, that Americans across this nation often have difficulty accessing care. And these barriers are often larger among those who live in rural and underserved communities. In my testimony today, I'll describe how emerging research may inform potential legislation. My first point is that telemedicine has resulted in a more modest change in healthcare delivery than initially envisioned. At the start of the pandemic, some contemplated whether the unprecedented rise, growth in video and telephone visits was the beginning of a new normal, one with telemedicine visits as a core component of how patients receive care. The reality has been more of a modest change in the most clinical areas and the number of telemedicine visits in the Medicare program continues to fall. In surveys, interviews, patients and physicians greatly value the availability of video visits and want them to remain an option. However, both have questioned the quality of care in a video visit and specifically the inability to conduct a physical exam. The second point is telemedicine does increase spending, but modestly. The key impediment the permanent expansion of telemedicine has been the possibility that telemedicine will drive up spending. Telemedicine's ability to make care convenient and more accessible, the key to its enormous potential to improve health, may also be its Achilles heel. In my own research, we find that greater telemedicine use does lead to more visits, and this is associated with small improvements in chronic disease medication adherence and fewer emergency department visits. However, these improvements do come at a cost. We estimate that greater telemedicine use is associated with a 1 to 2 percent increase in healthcare spending per Medicare beneficiary per year. And our results are generally consistent with other research, including those from MedPAC. Based on these findings, I recommend that the Congress permanently eliminate site location requirements and allow video visits for all conditions at any site. While telemedicine does increase spending, the increase is modest and is associated with some improvements in access and quality. And perhaps most importantly, patients and clinician want, clinicians want telemedicine to remain an option. And given this emerging evidence, it's hard to justify stopping coverage. Invariably, areas will emerge where we see both overuse as well as outright fraud. But I believe these areas could be addressed selectively. For example, Medicare could address concerns of fraud by requiring in-person visits if a physician wants to order specific high-cost tests. My third point is that telemedicine visits should be paid less than in-person visits. 
Payments for care in the Medicare program are based on the time a clinician takes to provide the care and the associated space, staff, and equipment. If something costs less, it should be paid less. While it does require some overhead, telehealth visits do not require the same practice expenses. Some clinicians have objected. They argue that their practice expenses have remained the same because they provide both in-person visits and telehealth visits. I disagree. I do not think Medicare should cross-subsidize in-person visits with telehealth because it will create distortions in care. It will give virtual only companies an unnecessary competitive advantage. It will also incentivize clinicians to give up their physical practice. Already we see that roughly 13% of mental health specialists have given up their physical office and gone virtual only. And lastly, remote patient monitoring is effective, but its value can be improved. Remote patient monitoring, like uh, others have said, is a promising clinical model that may improve the care for many Americans with chronic illness, and use is growing rapidly in the United States. And consistent with others, in my own research, we find that among patients with high blood pressure, it leads to greater adherence to medications and fewer related hospitalizations and emergency department visits. And another strength is that we find that it is more likely to be used by underserved communities. However, uh, in contrary to what others have said, we find that remote patient monitoring increases healthcare spending in the Medicare program. There are several ways we believe we can improve the value of remote patient monitoring. For example, instead of the current policy of unlimited reimbursement, I believe Medicare should limit the time period given the most of the benefit is in the first couple months. Again, I thank Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Neal, and distinguished members of the committee for uh, allowing me to appear before you today, and I look forward to your questions. I want to thank you all for your testimony. We'll now proceed to the, the question and answer session. Ms. Maddox, um, it looks like you have some helpers behind you too. Um, do you want to introduce them? Sure. Um, my daughter is Emmy. She's 12. And my son is Kai. He's seven. <laughs> so your personal story of living with ESRD and and experience with home dialysis speaks to the importance of expanding care at home options, particularly for kidney patients in rural communities who are more, more likely to utilize and benefit from home dialysis. What has been the impact of this option on your quality of life and your role as a working mother? And what, if any improvements, would you like to see to enhance the quality and convenience of care at home? Sure, thank you for that question. Um, in terms of the impact uh, to my quality of life, um, I think I mentioned earlier that from a physical perspective, the frequency of your treatments, of your dialysis treatments, have a direct uh, correlation to how you feel. So um, I noticed immediately when I started doing that first week of home dialysis training that um, having the consecutive treatments um, the impact on how it, it is on your heart and just how it hits your system, it's, it's just easier. So I felt better, um, I had more energy right away, um, and then when it comes to just the dietary restrictions and like the fluid restrictions that I was dealing with at that time, um, I felt that I was able to uh, have, more, have more control over what I was eating or when I wanted to eat or how much I was able to drink because of the frequency of the treatments. In terms of it being uh, at home, I have a lot of different appointments that I have to go to. Um, I'm listed at several or almost three um, different transplant centers. And so that in itself requires a lot of follow-up um, doctor's visits. Um, I spend a lot of time going back and forth to the doctor. The fact that I can have one thing where I'm eliminating a trip to a specific office that might be two or three hours away or a half an hour away, whatever the case may be, it makes, there, it makes an opportunity for there to be more uh, time that I can spend at home taking care of my family, doing work, or essentially doing things that I want to do. Thank you. The hospital at home has shown many benefits in its short time as a program, um, from reduced healthcare costs to better, better patient outcomes and lower hospital readmissions. Mr. Underhill, 
you've received hospital level care both in facilities and now in your home through this new program. In your testimony, you spoke of the benefits of recovering from your serious condition at home, better sleep, home cooking. Um, please describe the impact receiving hospital at home had on your family and friends to see, see you heal in your own home. Oh, because of the COVID uh, being at its peak then, they could not have visited me in the hospital at all. So I would have been on my own. And uh, if you've tried to sleep in a hospital recently, you know the, the beeping, the constant beeping that you can't figure out what it's for. I didn't have that at home. I also had my own bed clothes instead of uh, the uh, disturbing garment that you're issued. <laughs> Uh, all around, just having my own books and being able to get a glass of water and make it to the refrigerator uh, made such a difference. I also f just felt safer and less a burden. Uh, nobody wants to be a burden on folks. Uh, being at home, I was uh, on my own and uh, feeling better every, every day. Uh, so just that safety, the comfort, uh, the comfort of home and the comfort of friends and family, uh, that made a huge difference. And, uh, it's just no, <laughs> nothing like it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Starr, there is tremendous hope and expectations for an ever-expanding scope of, of health care at home services with high levels of satisfaction for both, both patients and providers. While most folks are probably familiar with, with telehealth calls with their doctor, could you please share with us the full scope of telehealth and health at home services you are seeing today across the country? And additionally, can you describe how audio only telehealth is utilized by the rural patients you serve? Yeah, thank you for that question. So we're seeing a scope that really encompasses the entire patient journey from both preventative care to uh, care of chronic conditions to really, you know, acutely ill patients in an intensive care unit um, at, our, at our small hospital um, that it would otherwise need to be transferred. And being able to impact patients throughout that whole spectrum is, is really where we see um, so much value. We approach our telehealth programs really from a value-based perspective, where our goal is to prevent the need for transfer to keep patients in their communities where they will heal better, and to even keep a lot of that revenue local to support those, those smaller hospitals. Um, in terms of the audio-only care, there, there are times where what you need to do is get a history from a patient. Our most valuable diagnostic tool is still a history, like talking to the patient, understanding how they feel, and that can be done over the phone if there are no other, no other options um, and, and can be a very um, significant way of collecting the information we need to help manage the patient. Thank you. Advanced technologies are aiding today's, today's healthcare providers in breaking through a broken status quo in the delivery of care to rural and underserved communities, improving patient outcomes and lowering healthcare costs. Mr. Altchek, from your perspective as an innovator in this field, where do you see the biggest impact, the most positive disruptions occurring, where, when, it, occurring when it comes to improving care in rural communities and how? Specifically, does ensuring fair reimbursement for services across varying geographics play a huge part in that? Thank you, Chairman Smith. Rural and underserved communities disproportionately face the impacts of chronic disease crisis in America, uh, and we have an opportunity as a country to do a much better job uh, being much more proactive, supporting patients, and keeping them out of the hospital to begin with. Uh, the technology today has advanced to a point where we can cover, you know, of, of the members of this committee, we have 13, we have patients in 13 states, uh, and we can do so in a, in a way where 84% of patients can share their vitals uh, at least 16 days a month, 
uh, which is important because a lot of these patients actually don't have broadband in the home. Uh, and the fact that we can do this is because we're leveraging uh, cell phone carriers in these local regions to transmit data. And so we've been able, with technology advances, to uh, broaden access in very meaningful ways uh, and in ways that are likely the highest, uh, the highest impact we can have in the U.S., which is turning the tide on, on chronic disease. Um, unfortunately, the way that Medicare reimbursement works for these services today um, is they're indexed by the geographic payments. Uh, and so uh, effectively in rural communities, you're paid anywhere from 20 to 30% less than in urban communities. Um, and as Congress, we have the opportunity to, to level the playing field and ensure that uh, patients across the country have access to cutting edge technology, which is only gonna get better over the coming decade. So I would assume that um, reimbursements in rural communities that in your testimony, 25 to 30 percent less, that clearly has a huge impact on the business decision that um, providers would have and whether they're focusing their efforts in a higher reimbursed geographic region, correct? Yeah, the, the, these programs typically cost Medicare between five and six hundred dollars a year on average per patient at the national payment rates. And that's for 12 months of 24-7 monitoring, cell-connected devices that transmit data daily. In the grand scheme of the cost of these patients, which is generally $15,000 to $30,000 a year on average to Medicare, it's a small cost. But if that $500 goes down to $350, $400, it becomes unsustainable in rural communities. And these are already the communities that are struggling the most financially, clinically to stay afloat. Thank you. I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Neal, for thanks. any questions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, and thanks. This was, this was very, very helpful. You just triggered, Dr. I'm uh, sorry, Mr. Alter, in my memory, you just triggered an interesting question. It's been part of the challenge that we have faced on the very issue that you raised. The idea, I think, is you've accurately described it, and we've had conversations that have been really good with, with both sides here. But the idea is not to ask urban areas to take a smaller slice. The answer is to bake a bigger pie so that people can participate. And I'm all in uh, on that suggestion. Uh, Dr. Marota, your testimony today was really good, as the others have offered. And the research applications and the impacts of telehealth, as you've described them, uh, tee up a couple of pretty good opportunities. We extended in 2022 pandemic era flexibilities for telehealth, hospital at home, remote patient monitoring with the intention of collecting more data to inform on patient outcomes. But it struck me that in your testimony, you've emphasized that it's still a lack of data that plagues us in trying to analyze quality and equity. That seems like a glaring gap in our understanding. But what types of data do you think we need to determine success for patients and policy care in the home, which we all support? And what data is sufficient to ensure patient safety? And what types of things should we consider when thinking about acute care hospital at home programs? Uh uh, thank you uh, for that great question. There's um, one of the themes I want to bring up here is that emerging evidence is there, but just as you emphasized, there's a lot to learn. And maybe I'll hit upon a couple of places where I think there are really important holes. We recognize in a lot of research that right now these ama am amazing technologies are not uh, being used equally across the nation. And we have a lot of interest in how do we make sure that everybody is using these technologies. How do we do so? What are the different kinds of innovations that we can use for that we can do to try to improve that? For example, health systems, others are investing in digital navigators to help patients figure out this very confusing, at least at first, uh, enterprise. Do those work or not? People have brought up the idea that in rural communities, what we can do is we can have TAPS, tele, uh, telehealth access points, where we can set up, I don't know, at a, a library, a clinic, where people can go there. If they can't get a video connection from their home, they can have a telehealth visit. That's a really interesting idea, but we need more research on whether that is effective or not. So I wanted to, that is one area that I think is really important is we want to make sure that these technologies are used by, are available to all Americans. What actually works, we don't know right now. And as a follow-up, you've indicated that uh, in your testimony that poor deployment of telehealth could instead increase long-standing disparities already exacerbated by COVID-19. How would you suggest that we might proceed with telehealth and other home-based care services that would bridge gaps and drive toward more equitable care rather than exacerbating disparities? And what types of data, again, 
you think success might look like. Right. I think that just, I want to, I think your question really hits upon a important, I sometimes see as a misconception, the challenge, the idea that if we offer one of these really promising services, those in rural and underserved communities are going to be most likely to use it. I think the data is pretty clear that it's actually the opposite. And often those coming, say, from wealthier communities are more likely to use these technologies. So the real question that you're hitting upon is how do we make sure that it's equitably available to everybody? And so those are how do we target those communities? What kind of investments can be made in there? What kind of programs do we need to support rural hospitals, for example, in making sure that they have that promising technology in their emergency department? Those are the kinds of investments and areas that I think we really need to do more work in. Thank you. Mr. Buchanan is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of our witnesses. Mrs. Maddock, let me ask you, uh, you make it sound so easy. I'm, I'm in Florida, represent part of Tampa Bay area, the region there, and deal with a lot of seniors and the challenges they have, and they make a lot of progress. But you, you make it sound uh, very manageable. you got a beautiful family. What's your secret? <laughs> uh. It's not a secret. Uh, I would definitely say that I'm incentivized <laughs> by uh, being able to take care of my family and being able to be with my family. Uh, I agree with you. It's definitely not something that I think of somebody who had, you know, for example, a mobility issue or something that was impeding their ability to do this. There would be some complications. But um, I think in people in those circumstances that um, they're able to work with their care partner um, if it's a spouse or a child or a friend, uh, for or someone told me this morning that she's a little bit short and so she can't lift boxes very from high shelves, uh, so she gets her neighbor to come and move the boxes for her. All of the things that I do, I promise you, I do. I have not spent as much time in school as some of the people here. Um, so all of the things that I do, it can be done by anybody. Um, it just. You just have to be willing to do it. And I think that if you are given the opportunity for autonomy and control over your health, it's, it's possible to do, you know, take your vitals, take your blood pressure, you know, take your temperature. Let me tell you, you're a superwoman. I can tell you that much. Be able to manage that because I see what our, our kids are managing with their grandkids and it's a lot of work and yes. you don't have those challenges. Mr. Underhill, let me ask you, how long might you have been in the hospital if you had stayed at the hospital and not went back home? It would have been three days, and it required the administration of uh, intravenous antibiotics over three days to uh, resolve the you situation. Think you would have been out in three days? I would have. Okay. Do you have any sense of the cost of if you would have stayed there? I'm just curious because I'm afraid I, I do not. Uh, okay. No. Uh, no, I do not have the difference in uh, the cost differential in that. Dr. Starr, let me ask you, we talk about, you know, telehealth. I think it's clearly the future. Uh, being in Florida, many of our seniors are an hour away, half hour away, two hours away. But when you think about, you know, the mountainous regions of the, of the country, a state like Colorado, you know, it's, it's five times or four times bigger or three times bigger than Florida. How do you manage that in terms of where people, uh, how is that working out in terms of people, do they have to, can move back and forth for a three-hour drive initially or something, or how, how does that work? Because this is clearly a road that we're going to, I think we're going to end up going down in a very aggressive way. That's just my opinion. Yeah, thanks for that question. It, it depends on the situation. Um, many of our interactions we can do fully remotely, and we can have a patient seen by a specialist and they can get the data they need remotely to take great care of the patient, I think equivalent care of that patient. Other situations, they'll come in once. Our teleoncology is a great example. They'll come to the big center to get their biopsy, to get the initial diagnosis, everything set up, and then we will do all of their treatment in their home community. And how, how far might they be away, some of your patients, in terms of accessing your facilities or the hospital? 150, 200 miles. Yeah, that's the thing I think a lot of people don't understand. Yeah. Can you touch on home infusion, too, how, uh, you, how that yeah. works for you and what makes sense and what doesn't make sense or how we can help you with that as well? Yeah, so appreciate that. 
I think home infusion is, is an area of massive opportunity. And, and one of those is actually kind of a no brainer for me. Um, we, we have patients now that are Medicare patients that under the current Part B regulations, they go to a skilled nursing facility just to get IV antibiotics, or they will have to, if they're in a rural community, travel great distances just to get an infusion. Um, home infusions in rural areas under Medicare don't exist, essentially. They're, it's incredibly rare. And you know, uh, Mr. Smith, you know, his, his proposed legislation helps a lot with the Part B piece um, to provide more benefits to allow us uh, to expand that. Um, Thank you. Let me just close. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit for the record the written testimony of Ms. Ashley Graves, who greatly benefited from the promises of home infusion. And with that, I yield back. Without objection. Mr. Doggett. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to each of our witnesses. I will focus in on telehealth. Uh, I offered bipartisan legislation in the last Congress that was supported by 22 health-related stakeholders after chairing a health subcommittee meeting in which uh, Dr. Murotra uh, testified uh, and worked with then-ranking member Devin Nunes to craft reasonable legislation that would extend telehealth for a couple years, permit some data collection, uh, and implement some modest guardrails that were recommended by the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, or MedPAC, to prevent the looting of Medicare through telehealth fraud schemes. Uh, this legislation would have required an in-person visit within six months prior to ordering high-cost uh, lab testing or durable medical equipment, as well as an audit of some of the outlier clinicians whose orders for these high-priced uh, services and devices are largely made through telehealth appointments. The Governmental Accountability Office, the Health and Human Services Inspector General, the Justice Department, and my own constituents have exposed a number of fraudulent schemes involving uh, telehealth and DME and lab testing. Here's what's been happening. Uh, information for, for some patients who were only seeking COVID-19 testing were fraudulently used to bill Medicare for cancer genetic test and allergy test without any medical necessity or the patient's knowledge. In other words, expensive medical equipment in no way needed by the patient was ordered. Last June, the Justice Department brought charges against 78 providers in an elaborate telefraud scheme involving 2.5 billion of fraudulent orders for braces and other items. These providers were found to have used these ransacked profits to purchase yachts, luxury vehicles, and jewelry. This case built on an earlier action involving $10 billion in telefraud. Uh, this, these schemes happen regularly uh, at both large and small scales. In September, another health executive pled guilty to $44 million in fraud using telehealth to order medically unnecessary DME, particularly back and knee braces, as well as genetic testing. In September, one nurse practitioner pled guilty uh, to ransacking $7.8 million taxpayer dollars. Just last week, I had an Austinite contact me because she discovered someone had fraudulently billed Medicare for 20000 in DME for her. So my belief is we need more telehealth. We don't need any more telefraud. And prevention is so much better uh, than prosecution after the damage is done and the taxpayer pays the bill. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I've been unable, unable to get enough interest in the Preventing Medicare Telefraud Act that I've offered this year uh, that focuses on eliminating this kind of fraud with reasonable measures. Dr. Marotta, uh, let me just ask you, given your considerable amount of telehealth, uh, given, given the considerable amount of telehealth fraud uh, which has occurred, namely this ordering of DME and unnecessary lab tests, would you agree that we need guardrails to protect taxpayer dollars at the same time as we extend telehealth? Uh, I Thank you so much for that question. I think it's a, a critical issue that you're raising. We will have issues of or overuse and uh, this outright fraud, which is abhorrent, and uh, using taxpayer dollars. And so we do need such guardrails. I think the one guardrail that you propose, which is that for selective tests that are being overused, such as DME or cancer screening tests, we do requiring in-person visit requirements for that is not a substantial burden on clinicians. And I think at least be one check on that kind of behavior. So I think those kinds of guardrails 
scales writ large are necessary as we continue to use telehealth. Thank you so much. And though I know you are a big advocate for telehealth and the benefit it offers, particularly in rural areas, would you agree that Congress should not extend telehealth coverage under Medicare without at the same time instituting reasonable checks to prevent this kind of fraud? Yeah, I think we do need to allow for the Medicare program to continue to introduce those kinds of guardrails um, because we need to make sure we do this in the most cost-effective manner. And from a clinical perspective, do you believe that targeted, modest guardrails, the kind I've outlined, would unnecessarily hamper patient access? Yeah, I don't think that that kind of in-person visit requirement is a very selective and I don't think would impact most Americans in any substantial way. Thank you. Well, I hope we can get it considered further in this committee. Thank you very much. And now I, I recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Certainly thank you to our witnesses as well. It's truly amazing to hear about new technologies that have expanded the boundaries of access to health care. Uh, every day we see new devices which allow services that could previously only be performed in the hospital to be accessed from home. Greater access to high-speed internet and the development of apps which can securely connect patients to providers from virtually anywhere in the world make it easier than ever before for patients to access the care that they need. Telehealth has been a game changer for access to care in rural areas such as my district in Nebraska. I've been advocating for expanded uh, telehealth since even long before the pandemic. While access to telehealth was pretty limited before the pandemic, during COVID, many of us quickly learned to rely on our phones and computers for routine healthcare needs. Unfortunately, most of the flexibilities we have come to rely on in the years since the pandemic are set to expire at the end of this year. I'm pleased that this committee has already advanced legislation I introduced with Representative Steele to permanently extend first dollar HDHP coverage for telehealth, but more action needs to be taken on critical geographic and originating site flexibilities and audio only options for those <coughs> excuse me, for those without access to high-speed internet. Even though telehealth has made it easier than ever for patients to connect with their providers, it is innovation in medical devices that has most dramatically expanded the ability of patients to safely receive care in their homes, as you have pointed out. For example, innovations in home dialysis technology have made it more accessible, made it a more accessible option than ever before. As new innovations make operations Easier than ever, such as the Tableau device, which can operate with just, with just normal tap water, an electrical outlet, and a drain. But lack of adequate Medicare coverage can often create roadblocks to adoption of new technologies that expand safe home access to care. That's why I introduced the Home Dialysis Risk Prevention Act, which would reduce the risk home hemodialysis patients face of serious complications from venous needle dislodgement. This legislation would ensure adequate Medicare reimbursement for the sensors and alarms that can detect when the blood return needle slips loose, putting a patient at risk of serious blood loss or even death. In other cases, we have the technology available to safely perform services like home infusion, but have to painstakingly legislate individual conditions into lists of, quote, medical, medical and other health services, end quote, in order to have Medicare cover them. In this case, Medicare is already explicitly allowed to cover home infusion of intravenous immune globulin for primary Im immunodeficiency diseases, but would require an act of Congress, my legislation, the Medicare IVIG Access Enhancement Act, to allow for the same technology to administer the same treatment for patients with CIDP or MMN. Rather than having to legislate every single new indication or new device, we really need to look at broader reforms, Medicare coverage, for, for home-based care. That is why this Congress, I introduced the Expanding Care in the Home Act to jumpstart the conversation on how Medicare needs to approach a whole spectrum of home-based care, including home infusion, home dialysis, and in-home primary care labs or diagnostics. I hope today's conversation lead, leads to further legislative action on removing outdated regulatory and statutory barriers to accessing these new and revolutionary technologies for greater access to care in our homes. Uh, Dr. Mahotra, from your perspective, I was wondering as a physician and a professor, what areas of care do you believe in the home uh, under discussion today are most impacted by outdated regulations? 
I think the one exciting thing is there a number of these technologies, I, I think home dialysis would be a great example of where we need to expand the use of home dialysis across the nation, be one where the regulations I think are quite problematic. I think remote patient monitoring would be another example of where I'm excited about the potential, but I think there are important changes to the regulations that can be implemented to really increase their use. Chronic disease is one of the greatest drivers of healthcare spending in the United States and morbidity, and anything we can do to improve chronic disease care is really important. Mm -hmm. Mr. Alchek, would you like to reflect on that a bit? Do you, do you see um, any particular area where there's more difficulty uh, to, to enter the, or to give patients more options. Yeah, I, I think uh, building on Dr. Mahorotra's point, uh, in chronic disease management, uh, we just need to do a much better job as a country. Uh, we have a, a, as you know, rapidly aging population, the majority of which have one or two chronic diseases. We don't have enough clinicians to take care of these patients. We need to adopt technology and more modern services as fast as possible to deal with the issues that are coming our way. All right. Very well. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. And now recognize uh, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to all the witnesses, thank you very much for being here. Um, I've been working on telemedicine, telehealth seemingly forever. Uh, I'm a big believer, and I think that uh, we can save money, time, and lives so long as we do it correctly. As some of our witnesses mentioned, many of the telehealth options available to seniors on Medicare today are slated to expire at the end of 2024. And I'd like to focus my questions on how this committee and how Congress can approach, uh, should be approaching that deadline. So, uh, um, Dr. Uh, Morota, I thought you did an excellent job in your testimony describing the balance we need to strike on telehealth. You used, to use your term, we need to prioritize high value cases and protect against low value utilization. I also share your observation that we can't really take away telehealth, that the genie is already out of the bottle and it's working, especially in the field of mental and behavioral health. So as we think about the upcoming December 2024 deadline, can you talk a bit more about the steps we can take to make telemedicine permanent and give patients and providers certainty while avoiding low value utilization? Thank you for the question. Um, and uh, I think that there are a number, uh, in terms of improving the value of these kinds of technologies, it a, lot, a lot of it really focuses on ensuring that the patients who are going to benefit most from that technology are going to uh, be the ones who receive it. I talked about how I felt that remote patient monitoring was a great example of how we can improve chronic illness management, but a lot of the patients who are receiving remote patient monitoring today are doing just fine with their chronic illness. We need to focus our money, our resources, our time on those patients who are doing poorly. And so how do we implement regulations to encourage that kind of targeting would be one example. You also raised the issue of mental health treatment, and I think an important regulation that we should be thinking about is uh, the current, uh, as of January of next year, we'll be implementing an in-person visit requirement before a patient can receive mental health treatment uh, via telemedicine. And that's an example of where I think that kind of regulation may impair Americans from getting the mental health treatment that they need, and is another thing we should be considering. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Starr, um, you mentioned that you have an emergency medicine telehealth program. I think you said over 90% of the patients at the clinic ultimately do not need to go to the ER even, uh, th even though they think they do, and each ER visit uh, costs over $1,400 on average. That's exactly the kind of thing I'm focused on. As I said uh, earlier, I want to reduce unnecessary care, not expand it. And it seems that uh, what your telehealth ER program does just that. Uh, can you tell me a bit more about how that works when the ER doc visits a patient virtually and the patient thinks they need to go to the hospital? Do you find that your providers are able to uh, accurately assess whether the ER visit is needed, and what are some of the examples of conditions or symptoms that might make a patient think they need to go to the ER? Yeah, so th this program is done in conjunction with 
uh, Instacares, both our virtual Instacare and, and in, in physical Instacares. So patients who present to be seen, and we are expanding to primary care doctors as well, they'll, they'll prevent for a complaint, for example, chest pain, and currently a lot of those patients are immediately sent to the ER. Instead of that happening, they will have a virtual visit with an ER physician who can see them, review what information we have, and then decide if they were gonna to go to the ER, what workup would we give them? And then can we do that outside of the ER? For example, if they need a, a CAT scan to look for a blood clot, we would arrange for a rapid outpatient CAT scan and they would go get it done and we would, we would follow up on, on the results. And, and does that fall into the category you mentioned earlier about preventive care? Um, is that a, a, a type of, is that an yeah, example? A, a type of preventive care, additionally, you know, like, like we've been talking about with diabetes and a lot of our chronic conditions, early identification and, and management of those as well. Thank you all very much. I yield back. Thank you, and now I recognize uh, Mr. Kelly for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and it's good hearing. First of all, uh, I think one of the things is that we failed to, and uh, Mr. Swikert will be here, I'm sure, he's because he's got a whole idea about disruption and what it actually means in our industry. So whenever I was looking, uh, trying to figure out, so how much of, an, of our economy is healthcare, and we say somewhere between 17 and 20 percent, but then we rank 11th worldwide in innovation, which is what Mr. Swiker talks about all the time. I'm a type two diabetic, and also in the in the district I represent, there's great distances between hospitals and patients. And what we're doing in a lot of the veterans' places, they they have a place where they can go in, sit down. It's private, and they can go online and get get information. So I, for all of you, now I've got to have Miss Maddox. What you're able to do is incredible, uh, Mr. Underhill. I I got to tell you. Uh, Getting care on a Saturday afternoon in the fall is very much the same in South Bend, Indiana, as it is in Chapel Hill, especially if it's a Notre Dame home game. So, uh, look, all of you are involved in this, and, and I really would defer to the doctors on this panel. I relate everything to the business model. I'm an automobile dealer, and one of the biggest drivers for, in, for people that are manufacturers is warranty cost. And we find a new way of doing diagnosis uh, where the cars can tell you what's wrong with them as opposed to a technician trying to interpret what it is that the owner of the vehicle is telling them as opposed to the vehicle telling them what's wrong with it. For those of you in that business, and it is a business, and we've got to address it as a business because it is going off the charts and what it is we're, we're able to do. Listen, I think telehealth is an incredible, incredible issue. I mean, for us to be able to sit at home and get the help we need, I think that's fantastic. But for each of you, they're in that business model, not so much the patients because you rely on it for your health, right, and your health well-being, but for those of you who provide it. What role does the government play? And I, I know it's, it, everybody always talks about the fraud and the abuse and everything else. I get that. That's in every single business across the country, not just in healthcare. What is it that you would suggest that we can do to make sure that every single dollar we invest is actually going to the care and the health of our, of our uh, taxpayers. So, uh, and you're all experts in this because you work with it every day. Can you give us a little more idea? So what is it that we should be concentrating on? Spending more money is not the answer. Getting a return on the spending is the answer. So what could we do? Dr. Starr, you can start in, and yep. Mr. Alchek, and then Dr. Marota. I, I, I want to hear from you all because you do it every single day. Yeah. I, for. For Intermountain Health, our answer to that is to continue to move towards value-based care. We're moving away from fee-for-service, everything billed fee-for-service, towards getting paid to keep people healthy. And if we do that, then that's where everyone can benefit. You know, re reducing costs and, and improving our margins as a healthcare system by reducing medical utilization, that's unnecessary. We, we completely agree that sensible guardrails make sense as remote monitoring and telehealth expand. In our space, there are three things that uh, guarantee a better outcome for patients and a again, guarantee a better outcome for Medicare. One is that um, 
On the other side of the remote monitoring, there's a 24-7 care team that can actually respond to the data and make clinical decisions, whether that's ordering labs or ordering medication. So uh, we encourage people who do deploy remote monitoring to have that 24-7 coverage. Second is integration into the electronic health records of the local physicians. We think it's really important if we're going to do a better job of chronic disease management, managing patients over time, we need to be sharing the data back and forth with the local physicians. Um, and then uh, the third point is reporting on, on outcomes and metrics. Uh, you know, we believe if we're going to be spending Medicare money, we should be responsible for reporting the outcomes uh, to make sure the government can decide whether that's well spent. I think the key issue that I want to emphasize is, like you, I'm just so excited about these innovations, and it's exhilarating as a physician to take care of patients in a better way. But the issue that kind of is at hand here is true throughout healthcare and maybe other industries also, where we introduce a new technology and we get excited about the benefits, but we also have to address overuse also. I'll give an example of cardiac catheterization. A device, a procedure that's life-saving, I imagine many of you in this room have had that uh, uh, life-saving procedure, but the data shows that we grossly overuse cardiac catheterization. So it's this balancing act. How do we make sure that the patients who will benefit most from that technology get it, but also ensuring so that we use our tax dollars effectively, that we don't overuse it and give it to uh, deploy it with patients who are not going to benefit. Well, so I want to thank you all for your testimony. I got to tell you, just because I do this every day in my life, one of the things that are really important when you have a private sector business and when it comes to warranty work, the people who pay that bill or the people who are in every month looking to make sure, this is called oversight, that you're doing the right thing at the right time for the right reasons and not just building for the sake of building to get revenue. So thank you so much for all being here. And Mr. Underhill, Ms. Maddox, good luck with your, your health as you go into the future. And thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. I recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This has been really a fascinating hearing. A number of us have been working on these. I appreciate, Ms. Maddox, you talk about waiting to be waiting. Uh, and I also appreciate the fact that you've got your reinforcements here. We have membership in the Congressional Bike Caucus uh, pins for them in a moment. Um, I, I do appreciate being able to focus on this. I must say I have some concerns about what happens with the application of private equity as we move forward with some of this. And I just it's just another area, if we're not careful, I think we can get run over. Uh, but this, I think, is uh, really appropriate. I am looking forward with Dr. Weinstrup uh, to introduce legislation to extend um, uh, the deadline, not the end of the year, but maybe even uh, more than a year extension, a longer extension, to be able to, to deal uh, with the impact of the care at home. This is a very powerful model. I think it's timely, and I would like to continue working with the good doctors. We're moving uh, out the door, uh, con concluding our legislative careers, but I think this would be a fitting area to be able to make uh, some impact. Uh, I uh, do appreciate the, the notion about home dialysis. I think it's a very powerful tool. Um, we're working with uh, Ms. Miller uh, to be able to extend uh, opportunities uh, with home dialysis, to be able uh, to, uh, in terms of uh, allowing Medicare reimbursement for in-home assistance, uh, the professionals who can do the training, and we want to do this right. Not everybody is uh, as adept as Ms. Maddox. Uh, people need that help. Uh, and providing additional education. Being able to get ahead of the curve to promote in a very thoughtful way, how we can realize this very powerful tool. I like the notion that it gives a context for the patient that you don't get uh, in a hospital setting. This will, I think, give a window uh, into the conditions of the patients, their families, uh, and their attitude. Uh, and these are areas that I am really fascinated about our potential. I look forward on both of these areas. These are not partisan. And these are things that the committee has done some work, has built a record of interest and accomplishment, and I think we ought to be able to utilize that to be able to move simple, common sense legislative proposals that don't have to be unduly complex, and they don't need to be expensive at all. Done right, and 
I appreciate uh, your admonition, done right, it'll end up saving money and improving outcomes. And I look forward to working with the committee, with Dr. Weinstrup, with Ms. Miller, on progress yet this Congress. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, now recognized for five minutes, Mr. Winstrup. Dr. Winstrup. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. Um, uh, I've lived the life of many of you uh, in your uh, experiences as patients and as providers. And, uh, and, and it is true, we have opportunities to do a lot here. Um, Mr. Blumenauer and I have worked together on many things. Uh, Ms. Sewell and I have worked together on rural issues. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot we can do. But today has been kind of um, hitting home to me and bringing back a lot of memories. Ms. Maddox, uh, you know, I had a patient with end-stage renal disease and I treated him at least monthly. He had neuropathy, he, um, chronic ulcerations that we would heal, and you're always at risk, right? And um, one day he came in and he said, I, I have to quit seeing you. And I said, why is that? He said, because the bus schedule changed and I can't get to you and to dialysis. Think if he had home dialysis, right? I changed my schedule so that he could still see me, by the way, <laughs> we worked it out. But understanding the challenges there's there and the advantage of some of these things that actually allow people to get the care that they need and get it in a timely fashion. Um, you know, and, but here's somebody I know and I know him well, and so if he were to, to call today uh, or later in my practice even, I'd say, well, you know, uh, take a picture of it. Take a picture of what's going on. Let me see if I need you to send you to the emergency room or have you come right into the office or, or maybe we can wait another week. But I know the patient. And so when it comes to telehealth, one of the things that's important to me is that as often as we possibly can, and COVID was different, you know, we, we need to have a relationship where we really do know each other in person. It, 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 at least at some point, we have to have done that. Um, you know, I had a patient one time, and now let's talk about home infusions. I had a patient that at one time Medicaid didn't allow home IV antibiotic therapy. So you had to uh, treat a patient. I had a guy in for six weeks. He has no pain whatsoever, but he's got a bone infection. He's got neuropathy. So six weeks he sits in the hospital getting IV antibiotic treatment. Well, he, he drove the staff nuts, and they drove him nuts. You know, he felt fine. If we had been able to do that at home, which later we did, I mean, I celebrated when we started to have this type of, of an option. But you got to have the appropriate workup. You know, so we're talking about guardrails. You can't just say, uh, he gave me a call. It sounded like osteomyelitis. I'm going to prescribe six weeks of antibiotic treatment at home. So you have to have some in-person clinical evaluation, all these types of things. I think that's important you know, as we're talking about how we're going to proceed forward with these things, it can be a great advantage. You know, for a lot of surgeries, elective surgeries, we're doing things preoperatively now uh, to try and make sure we get the best outcomes uh, so people can live the healthiest lives possible that you said, Dr. Starr. So I really appreciate all these, these comments. If someone's smoking, we say, look, this is elective procedure. You stop smoking, you got a better chance of healing. You know, you lose weight, you got a better chance of healing. All these things. And then post-op, you go home with a pulse oximeter, we're getting your blood pressure, we're getting your temperature. Some people don't know they have an infection, uh, but you can tell by what they can report back to you every day. These are great things, and you nip things in the bud. So, um, but I do think back, you know, when we're on call, you're taking care of your patients. If they called, you weren't billing for it. We just did it. And we decide, yeah, come on in, go to the emergency room, and then we start to be able to do photos. But these are patients that you know. So I worry about some, uh, not tremendously, because I don't think there's that many bad actors out in there, you know, but there's always some. You know, you can't just set up a business, you know, call me and I'll start ordering tests and do all these things and I've never seen you. Um, so we have to have some guardrails and parameters, I think, to work when, because it would be best practices anyway. Um, but I think common sense comes into play on a lot of these things. You know, most doctors, they're concerned about their reputation, they're concerned about the outcomes. They really don't care what, I don't care what Washington thinks, I concerned what my patients thought and what my community thought and my colleagues thought about how we were taking care of people. So I, I, don't, I don't really have a question because you're covering down on it so well today, but where we could have help is continue to give us input uh, on what you think for guardrails, 
and, and best practices and how we establish this. But look, patients are less anxious and heal better when they can be at home. And the more you can get them in that environment that they're comfortable with, the better off the patient care can be and the better results you're gonna get. So hang with us, help us drive on, and, and let's work together uh, through this. So no questions, because you've already answered them. Thank you, yield back. Thank you, and now I recognize Mr. Pascrell for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, it struck me that during this conversation with excellent witnesses, all of them, that health is so personal, but it is a good reflection of how we can come together in the Congress of the United States, believe it or not. I think it's so important that we learn from each other on this. We're fortunate to have some doctors on the panel, but so many health matters. I mean, it's an example for uh, substance, uh, transportation to work. Think about these issues. We have not, you know, I'm from an, an urban setting all my life. When I went, the first time I went to Montana, I was lost. Lost. A environmental matters. Uh, we seldom listen to each other because you're in another place and you have different problems. But health is a perfect example that we can move together and accomplish a lot. This is a pretty bipartisan issue today. And the witnesses kept it that way, which is great. Uh, it's truly revealing, like the pandemic was revealing. We learned a lot about ourselves. We have yet to learn everything from the pandemic, the consequences in our children. We learned America's healthcare system has deficiencies, yawning deficiencies uh, that must be addressed. But the lack of quality and compassionate care is not a problem for rural Americans alone. That problem exists right in the heart of the most congested cities in America. So we need to pay attention to each other, and we can't ignore it. There is no reason where you live determines whether you can get health care. I think we've crossed that barrier pretty well. And no, I've never heard any Democrat or Republican solutions that solve all the problems. I don't think you will find. When we work together on these issues, we control the outcome, I think. Americans in urban communities like my own face the same endemic challenges. Facilities face staffing shortages. I mean, places are closing. Equity's taking them over. They can't exist. They can't afford to. Don't tell me that's just a problem in the middle of southeast Alabama. It's a problem right in the midst of where all the money's supposed to be, in New York City. Retention struggles persist. I just was to a doctor early this morning. The person that that doctor hired to do his specific work, medical work in the office, was just fired. The equity company took over the outfit that he works for. She was fired because she was not necessary. 66 years old, single mom. Where the hell is she going to get a job at 66 years of age? Don't tell me that's just the problem in southeast Alabama or Patterson, New Jersey. We need more data comparing health outcomes between treatment settings. Any and payment models for the services, like we've been hearing from our guests today, home dialysis, which has been mentioned many times, must be fair to providers while not encouraging overutilization. And Dr. Uh, Miratra, and Dr. Stark, can either of you share with us some of the challenges of telemedicine visits and how we can find solutions to those barriers? Thank you. 
think that the main challenge does come down to you're not there and you can't do a physical exam. So th there are evolving technologies um, that allow us to listen to heart and lungs and, and other things that, that definitely will help. Um, but that, that, that physical exam piece is what we're missing. I think everything else in terms of history and, and evaluating the patient you can get via tele. I would just emphasize that point, that the American people like the value of these telehealth visits, but the concern is that the physical exam is missing, and the physicians agree. And so how do we bring the physical exam to the home is really, I think, the next frontier of where we're going to see telehealth evolve. Let me ask you just one quick question. Am I, is this pie in the sky, what I'm talking about, that health can lead the way to bringing the parties together, because nothing's more personal than our health and seeing that when we work together, we can get solutions. I don't mean problem solvers and that stuff. I'm talking about really down to earth issues day to day. Is that pie in the sky to you, Doc? I think that the issues that you're describing, and I would echo what you're saying, which is that the issue of getting access to timely medical care is a problem that so many Americans face no matter where they live. And I think it's, uh, I'm so glad that we're having this hearing on this particular topic. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Now I recognize Dr. Ferguson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to each of you for being here. Um, you know, one of the challenges, and uh, you know, my good friend from New Jersey and I go back and forth a lot on this dice, and you know, clearly, um, private equity in in healthcare is a, is is an issue. There are things that are that that are happening there that um, that I, I I have concerns about as well. One of the biggest challenges, though, <clears throat> as, a, as someone that has, has operated a small practice in rural America, um, and I think that anybody, any of the providers up here will tell you the same thing, the, the cost of doing business because of the regulatory burden is just absolutely through the roof. <clears throat> Couple that with, with, with decreasing payments from Medicare, um, you know, Medicaid not keeping up, and then just the unbelievable battles that, that private practices face every day with third-party payers. Um, it, it's a model that's not working and it's driving people out of private practice. So, I, you know, I hope that as we have a discussion about private practice, um, I hope that we will look not just at punitive measures that, that, may, that my, my friends on the other side of the aisle may look at from a private equity standpoint, but let's figure out the things that are driving people out of private practice. And it's the regulatory burden, it's the lack of payments, it's the, you know, it, it's, it's really, you know, many times we feel like David, David going up against Goliath. The um, only problem is we don't have any rocks in our pocket to, to sling at them a lot of times. Um, Dr. Starr, first to you, um, can you talk about um, how we're having this discussion about the, you know, about the physical exam. What's the link? I mean, what's the part of this where on remote home health that we've got a nurse or a nurse practitioner, um, LPN coming in to do a piece of that? How does all of that fit with the payment model piece? Because we talk about telehealth, which in some cases it is, it is, in most cases, it's, a, it's actually a great added benefit. But how do you weave in the payment piece of this for the, the actual person, not the physician, but maybe the nurse that's coming out to the rural area to check on the patient? What's the, do you see the dilemma we've got? We're, yeah. I think we're talking about either doing telehealth or in-office visit, but there's a very real component of someone, you know, of a healthcare provider coming to the house. How, how does that fit? Yeah, and, and currently I, I think that's one of the, the big holes that exists. Um, you know, there, the, the build amount for telehealth, um, you know, has been mentioned, you know, ideally can be lower because we don't have the overhead, unless that overhead exists because we need to have someone go into the home. And so for our, our hospital at home, you know, all of that is rolled into the, the payment for hospital at home. And we do have providers, you know, caregivers, whether it's community paramedics or nurses in the home to do the physical assessment. And then we can do everything else virtually. 
So it is a model that can be really successful, but there is not a great answer yet to, to how to do that. Do you, do you think it would be, <clears throat> I, I think at some point you're gonna have to segment out the, ver the various payment pieces. In offices, a certain amount, telehealth, a certain amount, then you've got the expense, I mean, look, having somebody drive 50 miles or 100 miles from, from a central location out to, out to do something, an injection um, in a rural community, I mean, that, that cost is exponentially more than the in-office visit. Yeah. So I think there's gonna have to be some, sort. I don't think bundling is the way to go because I, I don't think you gain the efficiencies. I think you're gonna have to segment out those various costs. Well, and that, that's where the regulations you mentioned really come into play. For example, currently with Medicare to do a home infusion, a nurse has to start and stop the infusion. Yeah. You're, yeah. It, it, let, let me, let, I'm, I'm get my time back here. Um, Dr. Marotha, um, one thing that I'm gonna disagree with you on is, is the fact that you think that telehealth in an office should be paid differently than, you know, than, than an in-office visit. It, you know, you, you've got an impressive resume, but you've never owned a solo, pract a solo practice in a rural area. I think there's a disconnect from what you see theoretically to what is in practice. That overhead still exists. That building still exists. Those, um, you know, the, the staff still exists. Their, their electric bill still exists. All of those things are there. I don't think that simply replacing, re, re, saying we're just gonna go to telehealth and we're gonna pay it less. I don't think that that's gonna work and I think it's gonna exacerbate the problem of people being willing to go into private practice and practice in rural areas or to, to, my, to my friends, uh, from New Jersey's comment, even even in some underserved urban areas. So with that, I would just say, I think you need to, I think you need to have, do a little bit of a reality check on on what it costs to actually operate a practice in a rural area. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. And uh, now we'll go two to one with majority to, to uh, minority. And with that, I'll recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, thank you to our witnesses for being here today to talk about uh, your personal experiences and, and helping us talk through this issue. Uh, my colleagues have raised some uh, really important issues and questions about how do we improve and expand care at home for Americans, and especially in rural and underserved communities. And I want to focus on how telehealth fits into this effort. All of us here are likely uh, are familiar with the importance of broad access to telehealth services. The COVID-19 pandemic, if, if there was any silver linings out of that, was it underscored how important these services were. Some of you here may have taken advantage of telehealth during the pandemic and discovered just how convenient it is, and not only in a time of crisis. In Kansas especially, telehealth bridges the gap between those who live in rural areas and who may not have easy access to certain specialties. Allowing for greater accessibility to telehealth uh, gives Americans living in rural areas increased access to quality and specialty health care. While telehealth is invaluable in rural areas, it benefits all Americans. Seniors and vulnerable populations benefit from the ability to meet with their doctor uh, from the comfort of their own home. Busy parents and professionals will be glad to, con to conveniently meet with their provider via telehealth, recouping precious hours that would have been spent commuting or in an office waiting room. In fact, nearly one in four adults report having utilized telehealth in the past month. Now that this technology has been available for some time, we have sufficient data to show how effective and beneficial telehealth can be. 91% of the patients utilizing telehealth report having a favorable experience, and 78% are likely to complete a medical appointment by a telehealth again in the future. There's a long way to go to ensure Kansans and all Americans have consistent, reliable access to telehealth services. To cite just one challenge, at the end of this year, the expanded Medicare telehealth flexibility waivers will expire, restricting telehealth access for large segments of the population. Dr. Starr, uh, I think many of us would agree that the acceptance and growth of telehealth has made a significant impact on our constituents' access to care, especially in rural areas. I have long been a supporter of telehealth and view it as a wonderful tool. However, in my district, uh, we've been experiencing significant provider shortages, not just for primary care, but specialty care as well. What suggestions do you have that maybe we can continue to expand and see telehealth as a tool, but not necessarily as a final solution to actual providers in rural areas? Yeah, thanks for the question. One of the issues we run into is the licensing and, and credentialing piece for telehealth providers, particularly across states. 
Um, there, there are opportunities, you know, to expand your pool of options if, if we could more easily uh, be credentialed and licensed across states to, to see patients. And, and currently that is a, a very expensive and time consuming process that limits things greatly. Uh, thank you. And, um, you know, while we've previously focused on the need for flexibility for patients, I, I believe that we should also focus on ensuring that providers uh, view telehealth as a valuable tool. And as mentioned before, part of that conversation should be viewed about proper reimbursements and what they should be for telehealth services. Uh, Dr. Marotta, uh, from your experience after initial startup and for material costs for technologies, what are other factors to be considered when looking at reimbursement rates? And I wanted to follow up a little bit on, on Dr. Ferguson's comments and, and uh, pick your brain a little bit more. Yeah, I think Dr. Ferguson and you both raise a really important issue, which is the regulatory burden. And just to put a point on this is that if you get, do a surgery, it makes a lot of sense, you submit the bill, but when you're doing an individual, I don't know, a text message on a phone or a quick phone call or something on a portal, it doesn't make sense to have all, you know, an individual bill for each encounter. So the real growth of telehealth and the really promising technologies we've discussed today also have brought to a head of like, how do we pay for this in a different way? And I think one of the things I'm excited about is, and we should just continue to expand upon, is trying to pay for these kinds of services with, say, for remote patient monitoring as a, a monthly bundled payment. So you get, here's a, here's a certain amount of money. You figure out what's the most appropriate way to care for patients. We're seeing this for opioid use disorder, where we pay a, month, you know, a, a payment per month. And I think the reason I'm excited about those is that, one, it can support the technology decrease the regulatory burden on individual clinicians for submitting all these little bills, and also allow clinicians and patients to figure out what makes sense for them under this circumstance as opposed to right, you know, having some payment rule for that. So I think this telehealth growth and payment reform sort of go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah that's good because, I mean, we, we talk a lot about the fee-for-service and, and the restrictions that are on that and, and paying to not be sick as opposed to paying to be healthy and stay in that way. So. Thank you all for your time and effort in talking through this. So I'll yield back. And, and now I'll uh, recognize for five minutes a gentlewoman from Alabama, Ms. Sewell. Thank you. I want to thank all of our witnesses here today. I represent Alabama's 7th Congressional District. Uh, it's actually my home district. I grew up in this district in the rural part. Uh, it includes Birmingham, historic civil rights cities like Birmingham and Montgomery and Tuscaloosa, Roll Tide. Uh, and, but it also includes nine counties of the rural black belt. So I was really excited that we're having this hearing today. My district uh, is both urban and rural, and I can tell you that um, home help and the ability in expanding services that one can receive at home really is important for a big swath of our population. It's not the sole solution. But I can tell you that my father um, was a nine-time stroke survivor and lived for a decade at home. And everything from the rehabilitation to his, um, you know, the, the breathing treatments that he had to have, all of those were done at home. And I believe my dad's life expectancy was extended because we have extended services that are available at home. So my question to you, uh, Ms. Maddox, is, um, you know, if you had an opportunity to have the President of the United States right here in front of you, what would make your life easier? What do you want us to know that would make your life as a, a home uh, dialysis patient um, better on the healthcare side? Um, and I can tell you that your lovely children who were, uh, who were um, uh, behind you are proof positive that this type of treatment has worked well for you and your family? Yes, thank you for your question. Um, I definitely agree with that. Uh, having the home dialysis option allows me to be a better mom. That's, we'll stop there. Um, but in terms of ways to improve it, um, we talked a lot about innovation several times here. And I, for me, I've seen, um, a lack of innovation across home dialysis uh, to begin with. You know, everything is being automated these days and simplified, but the process to conduct my treatments at home is- Very personal. Uh, it's very personal and it's, it's 
involved. There's a lot of steps, there's a lot of things to do, but then I've also found that the equipment and machines that I have to use, um, personally, my dialysis machine has been replaced probably four or five times, and it's a very scary thing when you have to do your treatment and your machine doesn't work. Exactly. And I know I'm, I have limited time. I wanted to just acknowledge that access is not just the, um, the medicine or the therapy. Also, med access is having the equipment that you need. Uh, in fact, one of, my, um, one of my constituents in Birmingham, he owns a small uh, home help, you know, um, a medical device uh, uh, equipment company, and their company provides home oxygen and hospital beds and other healthcare necessities for patients to receive treatment in the comfort of their home. Um, and we know that um, at home would be lost without having um, these uh, DME uh, providers outside of the hospital setting. Um, and so I think it's important that we, as a, as a committee, will um, make sure that home infusion drugs and biologists, bi biologics covered through the um, Part D durable medical equipment uh, benefit must support an extension of the 75-25 blend rate that allows small businesses like the one that I just described in Birmingham to exist. I think that we have to really burrow down into health equity and what that means. Um, and it is an access issue, but in this great country of ours, I believe that healthcare shouldn't be a luxury, but it should be a right of every American. And in order to do that, we have to bring costs down. And it's not just the cost of the actual medicine or the doctors, it's also the equipment and being able to provide it. On telehealth, uh, I, I wanna just say that um, it's not just telehealth. Audio only may be necessary in certain areas uh, that don't have broadband. And I'm uh, excited to work with this administration on the, on the $100 million that's going to every state to, um, to deal with broadband. My plea is that we start at the places that need the first mile, not the middle mile, not the last mile, but the first mile. And in, until we do that, I think we have to have innovative ways of making sure that we provide health care, and that includes at home. Thank you. Thank you. And now I recognize Mr. Smucker for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chairman for um, holding this hearing. I want to thank the witnesses as well for traveling to be with us here today. You know, it is exciting to hear some of the things that are happening in the medical field. We're going to see, I think, big changes in the way that uh, care is delivered. Patients will be experiencing uh, better care over the next years and decades, and uh, better care in rural and underserved communities as well. So it's really exciting. Uh, you know, we're talking telehealth, remote patient monitoring, home dialysis, home infusion. These all have sort of reached, in some way, the mainstream. They're cost-effective ways to deliver uh, quality care to patients right in the comfort of their home. It reminds me, I served in the State Senate in Pennsylvania prior to serving here, and we were talking a lot at that time about changing the system to allow folks to age in their homes. Um, and what we found was there were a lot of sort of um, regulations. There were, there were uh, funding um, reimbursement methods that that, that prevented uh, quick movement and, and allowing people to, uh, to age in their homes as they wanted to do. We, we found there was better outcomes. It's what uh, uh, elderly folks wanted. And actually, it turned out to be less cost as well. So it's like it was win, 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 but it was very hard to move to that because of regulations that were in place and so on. So Ms. Maddox, you, uh, you mentioned the lack of innovation. I don't know that I'll even have a question here, but. You, you mentioned the lack of innovation in the dialysis space, and I wonder at times whether you know, that is, um, if, if it's a funding, if it's the regulations that are in place, and I think the answer is probably yes, and so what we ought to be thinking about is how we can sort of unleash that innovation and, and encourage and incentivize um, that innovation. Um, and I think we'll find, we'll get a lot of data, if I do get time for a question, maybe Dr. Starr, I'll ask you, I would be interested in what data um, that we have available now about the improvement in the quality of care under some of these home health care things. But before I do that, because I may run out of time, um, I do, I want to talk just briefly <clears throat> about a bill that 
I've introduced with Mr. Dog and another member of the committee called the Medicare Home Health Accessibility Act, uh, which is related to some of the things that we're talking about today. This bill would establish occupational therapy as a qualified uh, Medicare home health benefit. Um, currently, a Medicare beneficiary can't receive OT services in their home unless there's also nursing, physical therapy, or, or speech uh, uh, services at the same time. And um, this bill would change that. So again, one of these regulations that I think is preventing uh, better care. So this would ensure that you know, seniors with um, conditions like low vision, dementia, diabetes, and other con conditions, instead of having to travel, will be able to receive that uh, care that helps them safely manage uh, activities of daily living and, and thrive in their homes. Um, and in the, uh, studies have indicated that OT services like this will create savings for the Medicare system by preventing falls and other accidents that too often lead to uh, emergency room uh, visits and maybe even hospitalizations. So again, with this bill, we want to ensure that the care that patients experience um, in a, an acute care setting is also available to them right at home, which is what many of you are doing as well. Um, and so I, I appreciate the work of Mr. Doggett. Uh, we've we've co-sponsored this bill together and hope that uh, we, can, we can see that pass. But, so Dr. Starr, I don't have a lot of time left, but I do, can you uh, build a little bit of what I mentioned and describe um, what we're seeing in terms of patient outcomes across the board? Are, are they equivalent at this point? Uh, are they, and I know we're early on in some of these things, but are they better? Uh, are the outcomes better when uh, patients receive services like hospital at home uh, or other treatments in their own homes rather than in a facility? Yeah, thanks for that question. So the, the data is still young, but what, what is emerging is that it is as least as good, leaning towards better in many of the outcomes. I think many programs have shown a decrease in readmission, 30-day readmission to being treated at home. There's definitely you know, a reduction in, in infections, like nosocomial infections, because you're not around those dangerous bacteria. Um, I, I think one of the really encouraging things is we also have seen it's, it's not dangerous to be treated with hospital at home. We're not sure. seeing bad outcomes for patient being treated, and it is a safe model in that sense. Sure, and I think as we, as we go along on this, we'll, we'll get more and more studies, so that'd be good here. We certainly know, I think Mr. Underhill, you talked about it, uh, Ms. Maddox, uh, the difference that's made in your lives to be able to, to uh, re receive care in the home. So appreciate uh, both of you, all of you, for, for sharing your stories and being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now I recognize Mr. Fitzpatrick for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, holding this timely hearing uh, on enhancing access to care at home. Uh, I would like to use my five minutes, uh, Mr. Chairman, to share a story about one of my constituents Joe Fiandra. Joe is a Warrington, Pennsylvania resident and a proud Army veteran. Joe was, uh, Joe was diagnosed with a debilitating disease called amyloidosis. Uh, he unfortunately passed away in June of 2022. And Mr. Chairman, I would like to enter into the record the testimony of Joe's wife, Helen, which explains Joe's situation and the importance of expanding access to those re receiving home infusions. That objection so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. After his diagnosis, Joe began the necessary infusions every three weeks. To get uh, to the infusion center, Joe and his wife drove two hours in order to get to their appointment by eight o'clock in the morning. His infusion process took a total of about six hours. The pandemic allowed Joe to get his infusions done at home with a visiting nurse. However, once this funding was cut off, Joe was informed that he would have to pay about $9,000 every three weeks if he wanted to continue to receive his infusions at home. This was not feasible for their family, and they ended up having to drive to a different state to get infusions. Unfortunately, Joe's situation is being lived out by many Americans, which is why I introduced the Joe Fiandra Access to Home Infusions Act of 2023 in honor of Joe to codify a proposed rule that would expand access to home infusion treatments to ensure that these life-saving treatments are covered under Medicare benefits. Uh, Dr. Starr, uh, can you speak to your uh, expansive home infusion program and explain uh, the critical importance of home infusion therapy for individuals like my constituent, uh, Joe? Yeah, thank you. It, it is a vital 
uh, program that provides care on an average of 1,500 patients per day in the state of Utah that, that are managed by our home infusion, receiving everything from IV antibiotics to IV fluids, uh, immunologics, biologics, uh, chemotherapy, electrolyte replacement, and, and nutrition. Um, and we have massive opportunity to expand that if we can remove some of the limitations that, that you mentioned in, in your bill. Additionally, just taking advantage of the existing technologies where many of our current home infusion patients, we actually teach to manage their own infusions. We provide them with the medications and the equipment to do so safely with backup from, from nursing if needed. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this bill is bipartisan. It's open for uh, co-sponsors. I hope that uh, both my Republican and Democrat colleagues on this committee will join me in helping millions of Americans get access to the home care they need. I yield back. Thank you. Now I recognize uh, Ms. Chu for five minutes. Um, Dr. Marotra, thank you for your testimony as both a professor of health care policy and as a physician. I'm the only psychologist in Congress, and I am especially interested in the impact that telehealth can have on expanding access to mental health services. I'm also concerned that if deployed poorly, greater use of telehealth may increase health disparities. So, um, Dr. Marocha, in your written testimony, you note, noted that 13% of mental health specialists have closed their in-person clinics and now only see patients via telemedicine. You also mentioned that many of the new direct-to-consumer telehealth companies are growing rapidly using venture capital funding. While telehealth-only providers may improve access through innovative models, does this trend have the potential to limit access to mental health care for underserved populations? And what are the guardrails you think are necessary for direct-to-consumer telehealth services when it comes to delivering mental and behavioral health care? Yeah, I think I really appreciate you bringing up this issue of the rapid growth of these virtual-only companies for, you know, maybe uh, the biggest presence is in mental health treatment, but across the healthcare spectrum we're seeing these companies. And I think that they both have both real positives, potentially increasing access to care and getting into rural and underserved communities, but I also share your concerns that we could have issues where we could exacerbate disparities and also, uh, you didn't say it, but I think it's also we all know that there are concerns about the quality of care that some of these companies could provide as well as um, uh, prescribing behavior that we think is inappropriate. I think there's a key issue here is that it, right now we have very little data. This is a real data gap in terms of understanding what the impact of these companies are. And I think we need to, as they starting very quickly to enter the Medicare program, ensure that we are actually monitoring these companies effectively so that they're not leading to these negative consequences that you raise. So I really appreciate the question. We need more research on these companies. Thank you for that. And Dr. Marotra, I wanted to talk about other um, issues for underserved populations. For instance, limited English, uh, English proficiency. At, and right now, that of course remains a significant barrier for access to health care for more than 25 million limited English proficient Americans. And as we discuss the need for expanded telehealth, I need to um, make sure that uh, those who are limited English proficient are not left behind. So can you discuss the ways that telehealth can help expand access to care for those who face language barriers in the healthcare system? Have we seen examples of telehealth successfully serving these communities in recent years? And conversely, can you discuss any risks or challenges that expanding telehealth services could pose to this population? Yeah, I think that uh, I appreciate you raising this issue of limited proficiency because um, for many patients, going one of the real advantages, the potential advantages of telehealth is to facilitate interpreter services. If you speak a specific dialect, you may go to the clinic and not have someone who actually speaks that dialect and allow telehealth can facilitate that because you can have a interpreter who's very far away who could join a three-way call. So I think that's one of the real positives that we could see. But I also do have concerns that in the, what we find in the data is, is that we sometimes clinicians make assumptions. And I'm probably guilty of that also, where I assume that a patient can't do a video call and I have to do it via a phone call and so forth. Or, and so I think we also need to be 
focused on the clin uh, provider community to ensure that all patients, including those with limited English profici proficiency, are offered the video visits and we don't make assumptions that they can't do it. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Marocha, you also discussed the digital divide in many low-income communities of color. Um, how about the disparities in telehealth ut utilization and the issue of internet access and insurance co coverage? Uh, what guardrails would you suggest Congress look at to help ensure that vulnerable communities are not left behind in the expansion of telehealth? Yeah, I think that this is a, a, a really important point that, as I said before, we cannot make the assumption that if we offer this to everybody, those underserved communities are going to use it more. If anything, we're going to see it less. So what do we, what investments do we make among and I think it goes two ways. One is obviously focused on the clinicians themselves, ensuring they're offering those visits and they have the resources and ability to invest in telehealth. But I also recognize that this is not just healthcare. There's a little aspect of the digital divide is not limited there. And is I often wonder a lot about which is the lane of healthcare providers. Should they be addressing these issues or do we need more community resources to allow for, say, digital navigators that can both help with healthcare but also education, work? There's, you know, the digital divide uh, uh, goes across all of our lives, not just healthcare. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Now I recognize Mr. Swikert for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You look good in the seat. Thank you. Um, and I apologize for the crying. It was back there. I, that's my 20-month-old, and yes, I have a 20-month-old. Um, um, Mr. Alchek, um, can you and I actually, let, will you work with me conceptually for a moment? Um, I, I want you to say, think about the platform you offer today. If you actually had a supportive federal government, or one, it just got the hell out of the way, what are you capable of? And, and part of this is um, I'm a bit of a, a believer that the solution, and I know this is mostly about um, rural access, but um, we've seen data that makes it very clear for certain urban populations, for my tribal populations in Arizona, Southwest, that using technology is capable of being a credible disruptor and that we often our rules, our inability to allow an algorithm to write a script, all these other things that go on, we have the barriers that actually keep the miracle from happening. I mean, you just had a language question. Well, the fact of the matter, you and I know that the adoption of certain of the chats, I mean, the IRS is doing it this tax cycle, can pick up dialects and different languages, and it's remarkably accurate. Um, we need to move faster. So I come to you and say, all right, you have this platform. What does it look like five years from now if you could run amok and adopt technology? How much more, how much healthier, wealthier would our society be? Thank you, Congressman. And uh, I think the important policy consideration is where Medicare goes, so goes the country. And so the decisions you make here are incredibly important. So, so your argument, so your first comment is on its reimbursement. Yeah, it, well, reimbursement, and, and I would say w what's possible here. You know, there's easily 30 million. Medicare patients who struggle from hypertension, out of control diabetes, and heart failure. And we data shows consistently that we can get patients' blood pressure under control uh, in very meaningful ways. We can double the percentage of patients who get to that magic 130 over 80 blood pressure number, and we can do it for 10 million patients likely in the U.S. Uh, in heart failure, there's 7 million patients with heart failure in the U.S., number one cause of hospitalizations for Medicare patients we could likely reduce those hospitalizations by upwards of 20 to 30 percent, which is tens of billions of dollars can I, to Can I give you a, qu a quirky one that we've worked on for years, but we get ignored? 16% um, of all healthcare spend is those not taking their meds, you know, their calcium inhibitor, their statin, whatever it may be. Um, you work with the prescribers, and for 99 cents, there's a pill bottle cap that beeps at you in the morning if you haven't taken your calcium inhibitor, your hypertension medicine. I mean, I I exactly. And, that's, and, that's, and let's see, 16% of U.S. healthcare would be $600 billion a year? Uh, American technology has a great track record of making things better, cheaper, and faster. And I think we can, ac we can, we can accomplish a lot uh, together. But you could even do it with an app that just pings you in the morning. Text message, phone calls, 
there's a lot of opportunity. So what do we do to get platforms like yours to actually start to move that sort of techno magic and make people and help people be healthier and at the same time, you know, you have a country that is collapsing financially with the, with our growth of debt. We're borrowing what ninety five thousand dollars a second, and almost every dime of the growth of that spending is interest and healthcare costs. Yeah. What do we do to change? Instead of taxing more, you know, we can keep taxing people and spending more money, but those are, that's the financing side. We're doing almost nothing to change the cost of healthcare. Um, so we've had a running discussion with many of my rural colleagues, um, I represent an urban suburban district, saying, okay, so you want to spend this much money to run a piece of wire out to the middle of my Navajo Nation chapter house for a fraction of a fraction of a fraction, and tomorrow I can give them a satellite dish, I can set up Starlink or something of that nature, and instantly they have telehealth. Except they're not the ones who are here lobbying to run the wire, which we've been doing for 25 years, and never seems to get there. Tell me, tell me how I'm wrong. I, I, I don't think you're wrong, and I, and I think hearings like the one today uh, are important because uh, providers need to know and clinicians need to know which investments they need to make for the long term, and if reimbursement changes can be made permanent, then providers will do the right thing and, and build out these technologies and deploy them at scale. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, with your permission, I have a number of articles um, we'd like to submit for the record in the adoption of technology improving access, particularly in my tribal communities, and crashing the price of health care, and that it's our own policies that are the barrier to the adoption of these technologies. With that, I yield back. Without exception, so ordered. Uh, thank you. And now recognize for five minutes, Mr. Hearn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for having this hearing. It's, uh, it's good to see everyone. Thank you for the witnesses for your long time sitting in the chair, but I know you're talking about things you love to talk about, so that's awesome as well. And are those your children back there? I'm glad they're warm now because it does get cold in here. <laughs> they, look, they look great. Uh, and I'm sure they're happy that their, their mom is healthy with uh, the home dialysis that you're able to do. And so thanks for having them here. You know, it's great to hear about technology as being an engineer. It's exciting always to see how we can use technology as, as technology advances. And as my colleague, Mr. Swikert said, you know, we could do a lot if given the opportunity. So we, we have to figure out how to remove these impediments to to really moving healthcare forward in the 21st century. And, um, you know, as we, we, as we do that, we take away the travel time. I live in a very rural state in Oklahoma. There's a lot of, um, a lot of work goes on to figure out how to make that happen. In many cases, first time uh, prescriptions that work as opposed to trials that we, you know, you don't have to run down the block, but you don't get off the tractor to come to the doctor. You can just say, I'm just going to live with it, statins, you know, heart medicine and others. Um, I've worked on many pieces of legislation to support this, that, um, to, from telehealth services, one of the first bills that came out during COVID. I've often said that COVID took 10 years of future technology and utilization of technology and compressed it into about 18 months. And so we have to hurry and catch up with our policies to make, you know, to catch up with technology. And so we're a little out of whack now. I'm sure that everybody in this room, not just the witnesses or the people up here, everybody in this room has had less than ideal experiences in a hospital or a doctor's office, sometimes waiting for what seems like a, just a rudimentary test, a blood pressure test, you know, a, a blood sugar test, and saying, why am I waiting and you know, taking half a day to make that happen? The, the stress of that and the bad experiences, and then when we hear your testimony, it really makes it um, uh, plausible that we try to figure out all of us working together and we've heard our colleagues on both sides of the aisle here today talk about how we need to work together it's not a political thing but how do we make this work so that we do protect some you know uh, there's always bad actors in every industry we want to make sure and I know you all do as well uh, within my lifetime it's been amazing to see how new technologies have improved the way patients can get treatment last year I introduced HR 1451 1458 the access to pre prescription Digital Therapeutics Act to continue my commitment to supporting innovation in healthcare and to make these technology advancements more accessible. The DPTs uh, can, you know, be used at home to treat a variety of issues as with veterans and PTSD. We've seen many showcases here of the different technologies. Um, I hope we can have this committee and can continue to support expanding technologies that make patients' lives better. 
Just last week, I heard from a constituent who provides care at the Utica Park Clinic in Tulsa, who started offering remote patient monitoring services last year. Currently, uh, they monitor over 14,000 patients from their homes from all over the state of Oklahoma, and I've heard firsthand how beneficial remote patient monitoring is from clinicians providing these services. This, in kind, or this kind of in-home care allows for better communication between patient and provider and improves adherence to regular testing for things like blood pressure and other vitals. Uh, Mr. Alchak, um, can you tell us the vision uh, you see for the future of remote patient monitoring and how scalable you think these types of treatments can be? Thank you, Representative, and uh, we're proud to work with many constituents in your district. Uh, I think the most exciting uh, the most exciting opportunity for remote monitoring in the chronic disease space is to truly be proactive about healthcare. We're incredibly reactive today. We wait till patients show up in the ED to treat their high blood pressure, and, and at that point, it's too late. Um, in, your, in your district uh, and with your patients, we've seen incredible outcomes. Uh, we've seen 43% of patients with type 2 diabetes getting their A1Cs to goal, uh, and the long-term implications for that in the community are massive, uh, and it allows patients to get care in the comfort of their own home that's super convenient uh, and, 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 and skips long trips to the physician's offices. So uh, thank you for the question. Well, I was able to stop by your demo booth. And if you could just share with us what kind of savings uh, we could see with these services. You shared earlier some of the things, that, some of the successes you've had in ambulatory care and things of that nature. If you could share that for the, for the record, that would be awesome. Yeah, our, our data shows that uh, we're able to reduce the total cost of care, inclusive of the additional costs for remote monitoring by 23%, um, primarily driven by lower uh, ED utilization, lower inpatient admissions, lower skilled nursing facility, and no, lower home health. Uh, so effectively, we're keeping patients independent and healthier at home for longer, which is ultimately our goal. Again, thank you. Uh, again, I want to thank all of you for being here today and, and sitting and giving your testimony, but I know it's something that you really are sincere about seeing changed, and uh, we're here to work with you to make that happen. So thank you all. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. Back. Now I recognize Ms. Delvini for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here, and Ms. Maddox, thank you for sharing your story and your time with us today. Um, as you noted in your testimony, Hundreds of thousands of patients across the country are spending three to five hours per week, three days a week, um, at a, or hours per day, three days a week, at an in-center dialysis clinic, often for years on end. And that does not include time getting to and from the clinic, getting your kids to school or to childcare, trying to keep a job and earn a paycheck and, try, and juggling all the other responsibilities of being a parent. But if more patients were able to do their dialysis treatments at home, like you, some of the, these stresses could be relieved. Countless studies show that the quality of life for patients dramatically improves when given the option to receive treatments at home. And home dialysis rates in the U.S. have increased roughly 7 to 15 percent since 2011, but we're still far behind other developed countries that have achieved much higher rates. And so, um, Ms. Maddox, I want to start off, how did you learn that home dialysis was even an option? Uh, thank you for your question. It was uh, something that was mentioned to me in passing uh, when I was in clinic. Um, you know, a nurse or a doctor would just come by and say, why aren't you doing this at home? Um, but they weren't giving me much information about what was uh, necessary for that or what it entailed, and I didn't know much about it. Um, my husband was also in dialysis for a short time, and he did dialysis at home um, through peritoneal dialysis, so I knew what that entailed. Um, but it wasn't until uh, the doctor that I have currently um, explained to me the benefits of doing the more frequent, shorter dialysis sessions. Um, and then after a series of bad experiences that I had at my clinic, um, at that point I thought I needed to look into it a little bit more. Um, what was the process like shifting from uh, in clinic to at home dialysis? Sure. So the, the first uh, clinic that I was at, um, trying to um, get an appointment with my dial with the home training nurse was very difficult. Um, they were unresponsive, and uh, they gave me some papers and pamphlets, but they didn't really uh, help me with that process. Um, my doctor eventually directed me to a different. Um, a different nurse at a different clinic. And from there, he took care of everything. Um, he helped with the training. 
uh, he even came to my house and set up my equipment and, and you know, got me going. Um, so with the person that I had, um, it became much easier, but also recognizing he's the only person that works at the home training facility that he's at. Um, and so I know that that, with the logistics administrative work and, and with the healthcare part of it, it, it can be a lot for one person. And how long did it take then, you think, from when you first decided you were gonna do it to when you finally were set up and home? Once I connected with the, the training nurse that did actually train me and that I work with now, um, it was a couple of days. Okay. He, we arranged um, for me to come into the office, into his clinic, um, not the next day, but the day after, and I was able to start my training immediately. And you feel comfortable now doing it at home? Absolutely. That's great. Um, we need to make sure that people have the resources and the information they need and so that they can do that quickly too. Thank you. Um, it's a slightly different question. Um, Dr. Marotra, um, in your testimony, you argue that policymakers should focus on expanding telehealth when it would most significantly improve health outcomes or barriers to access. And providers that are, participate in alternative payment models or APMs have the financial incentive to target telehealth use to when it's the most impactful, which seems to align well with your proposed approach. And so I wondered, um, how can telehealth policy support CMS's goal of having 100% of traditional Medicare beneficiaries in accountable care relationships by 2030? Yeah, I think that's a, you raise an important issue, which is that um, if uh, we want, in, a, in such an arrangement, the clinician has the responsibility both for the quality and spending of the patients. And I think that providing clinicians in those such arrangements as much flexibility as they want in terms of how to deploy, so removing any regulatory barriers, payment barriers for those specific clinicians could be both give them the flexibility to provide care as they see fit for their patients, but also potentially create an incentive for those clinicians to join such uh, 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 alternative contracts, because that could be uh, another way of uh, reaching CMS's goal. Thank you. I'm out of time. Um, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kostoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling today's hearing, and thank you to the witnesses for appearing. If I could, to Ms. Maddox and Mr. Uh, Underhill, appreciate your testimony. First of all, your testimony about how at-home care has benefited you. Ms. Maddox, your story was really touching and very moving, and, and everything that you've related uh, during the questioning that you've had, so I appreciate both of you very much. Dr. Starr, if I could with you, maybe a little bit different question. Can, can you talk about um, how you treat the at-home patients now, and maybe from a diagnostic or treatment standpoint, but diagnostic, um, what you think will be improved on two years, three years, five years out, maybe that would be better in the future or, or more capable or things that you're looking forward to, if that makes any sense. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, really fun question, actually, for me. <clears throat> so number one would be an improved ability to monitoring uh, in the home, including continuous telemetry monitoring. We could monitor heart rate and, and rhythm um, in, in a much improved way. Uh, second would be, you know, point of care laboratory testing in the home that could immediately give results um, of, of many more lab tests. Uh, third, um, we are seeing pocket ultrasounds coming where even nurses can be trained and technicians can be trained just how to put an ultrasound on different parts of the patient's body and then those images can be read either by artificial intelligence or, or a, a radiologist and, and get almost instantaneous um, you know, re results uh, that in many ways could replace chest x-rays and, and other imaging um, where you, you could have a patient with a status change or new symptoms that you could immediately diagnose. Um, and, and those are a, a couple of the ones that just immediately come to mind. In terms of the at-home lab testing, can you, can you give an illustration of how you think that might work and what, that, what you yeah. would specifically test for? 
Yeah, so, and, and some of this technology exists and is being used, but there are certain uh, lab tests that basically you need a, a drop of blood and it will, it will uh, give you results. So, you know, metabolic panels, electrolytes, kidney function, um, blood counts, those sort of things. And, and there, there is a lot of work to expand what we can do with that sort of testing. Good. Thank you. Mr. Alchek, if I, if I could with you, maybe the, the same question. First of all, I appreciate the technology that the patients don't have to have broadband. Uh, they, uh, you, you can do it based on cellular service. What are, the, what are some of the things that you look for from a technological standpoint maybe 24 to 36 months out that aren't available today? Thank you for the question. Uh, we're getting the ability to monitor more vitals more frequently, uh, which gives us uh, better data on how to manage patients. And then the second big piece is we're, we're able to do it in a way that's more passive for patients. And so I think over the next uh, few years, you're going to get the opportunity to hopefully get blood pressure from potentially a simple device as a watch or blood glucose from a watch and not have to prick yourself. Uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunities, maybe not in the next 24 months, but definitely in the next five years. Um, and the question is, you know, how are we going to use those to, to, to deliver better care? In terms of, um, Dr. Starr, in terms of the, the monitoring from a physician standpoint, do you see, of course, we're now four years into the pandemic, four years yesterday. Do you see pushback from any physicians <laughs> as it relates to care at home or, or telehealth? No, not, not push back. I, I think it is a new way of doing things, and that makes it challenging. Like, it feels weird to people to do some of this care in such a different location, and normalizing it is still part of the process we're undergoing. And it's one reason volumes still aren't as high as they will be. Mrs. Uh, Maddox, if I, if I can with you, and I, I think you've said this, but I'll just ask you in, in a different way. So you talked about having to go originally to the dialysis clinic three days a week, uh, what you would miss in terms of your, your children. Now that you're able to do dialysis at home in the manner that you've done it, do you see any difference in the, pardon me for saying this, the level of care or, or treatment that you receive at home versus what you would see in the clinic? I would have to say yes. Um, at the clinic that I was at before, uh, immediately before I started home with dialysis, I was finding that there was a, a tremendous amount of non-patient care-related pressure that the staff was under there. Um, for example, they were required to get the patients um, connected in a certain time frame because they were required to have a certain number of patients dialyzed in a specific period of time. Um, so when they would come over, they would have to rush through, um, you know, putting the needles in and, t and taking everything. And, you know, I would try to make small talk and they couldn't do that because they were trying to just get through their required time frame that they had to finish by. Um, my doctor and my dialysis nurse, um, I would say are, we're almost like friends <laughs> at this point. Um, and I, I, we touched on it earlier, but the holistic uh, care that's required for knowing the entire patient and not just knowing you know, the immediate care needs, but knowing everything about uh, their life that feeds into their care, um, I think it's something that's, that's valuable and, and has been part of my experience in home hemodialysis. Thank you to the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Ms. Tenney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Ranking Member, for holding this uh, meeting, and thank you to our distinguished panel here. Uh, this is uh, something that I think has been so necessary in my district in upstate New York which spans hundreds of miles and across all kinds of rural communities and, and it'll be even larger next year. And I have seen so many uh, people in my community who do not have adequate access to care. It's, it's, it's a huge problem. Uh, we had this issue with uh, where we finally got telehealth at least or telemedicine to uh, the Veterans Administration through the, our VA clinics uh, to get them some, especially because of the pandemic, but it was really great to have that. Many of these people, as, as I know some of my colleagues have cited, have a hard time getting to these facilities. Uh, it could be a many hour drive. In, in my area, we have lake effect snow. Almost the entire district is in the lake effect uh, strap, uh, stripe of New York State. And uh, you know, just it, it's just been a, a tremendous uh, burden on them. 
And one of the interesting things that stumbled upon me the other day, and we've been pushing telehealth, and obviously I was very interesting that uh, Dr. Alchek, you said, you said that, um, you know, where Medicare goes, uh, so goes the telehealth, I think was what you said. Well, last year I happened to be uh, stumbling upon a 200th bicentennial of the, of, uh, the town of Macedon in, in uh, Wayne County, New York, a very rural area. And uh, I walked into the library just to get set for the big bicentennial celebration, and they had in there a digital privacy booth where patients could go and call up their doctor in a secured setting and look at their doctors. And I thought this was pretty incredible. So I wasn't sure exactly what it was, but it was actually a test put out by the University of Rochester Wilmot Cancer Institute and the Community Cancer Action Council and a, and a group of about 29 stakeholders in upstate New York to try to see if this is something we could do to bring telemedicine to rural communities. And it was interesting, this was the test site. So I was fascinated by it and I think they're getting great results. And again, the big question is, how do we get Medicare to get us there so we can get health care to so many people struggling in rural communities? And that's why I wanted to ask you, uh, Mr. Elchek, about how do we, and I know that tele, telehealth, telemedicine is, is the step before we get to where you are. How do we make that, can health, telehealth, telemedicine be valuable uh, in, in predetermining in some ways what happens when you, uh, get to the, the stage where your vision is with Cadence to get people to full health care. And how do we get there? Obviously, Medicare is going to be a big part of it, but I'd just be curious about your, where you, your vision is, since you're obviously a visionary leader here. No, uh, th thank you for the question, Representative. And, and my wife, who's a physician, will, will be upset if I, if I don't say I'm, I'm not a doctor. Yeah, she <laughs> reminds me that uh, no, every day. I see day. doctor up there. I figured I'd just say Yeah, no, no, no. She, she, I'm a doctor of laws, right? <laughs> she would be, my wife would be very upset if I didn't, if I didn't say that. But... Um, <laughs> You know, to, to, to answer your, 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 your question, um, uh, telehealth is a very valuable tool here. Um, and when we think about chronic disease management, I think one of the things that's most exciting is the ability to give patients access 24-7. Uh, and so you, you talked about the lake effect in your, uh, in your district right now. Uh, on President's Day, I guess that was three weeks ago now, Monday, we had 300 patient red alerts, which are those blood pressure is above 180, as I was talking about, and 300 patients call in proactively. And the fact that now they have access to care 24-7 has a massive impact. A lot of those patients would have ended up in the emergency department if they could have gotten there. Um, and so the, the, the opportunity here to create a better experience for patients is very meaningful. Well, thank you. And I want to just jump on one thing that just came to mind while listening to you uh, with these lake effect problems. One really urgent problem we have is the closure of a lot of hospitals and the and the real, really most of our rural hospitals operating in the red. Uh, one of the issues uh, that has come up is the safe patient staffing rule that we have in New York State and also a requirement that an RN be uh, visible. We've had numerous people come in and, and, uh, and constituents say that we can't even find an RN for an entire county. So how do we, how is your model at Cadence helping us because obviously you're monitoring people at home. How do we break, we comply with something like the safe staffing rule that is in New York and has is also uh, been uh, proposed here on the federal side? I think one of the interesting opportunities with this type of chronic disease management is um, you can help clinicians treat more, manage more patients safely and effectively. And we have such a large provider shortage in the U.S. that we need to use technology to help providers be more effective managing more patients safely. Uh, and, and there's a very large opportunity to do that. Great. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the witnesses. Wonderful. I'm sorry I didn't get to everybody, but uh, tremendous uh, to hear you all. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Kildee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this really important hearing. I want to thank the witnesses. Uh, all of you, but in particular, Ms. Maddox and Mr. Underhill for giving us the human side of this story. I really do appreciate it. I once worked in Newburgh, uh, and I'm a PBS fan, so Mr. Underhill, I don't know if it's been raised because I've been coming and going, but I'm a, a fan of your, uh, your work on television, so thank you for that. Um, last Congress, um, and you, you'll hear this theme, there's been a lot of, of bipartisan work in this space. Last Congress, I joined Dr. Wenstrup introducing the Rural Behavioral Health Access Act, which would have extended the pandemic era policies that allowed Medicare to pay critical access hospitals for mental health services um, delivered by, by a telehealth, even when the patient they're caring for uh, is not located uh, at the hospital. 
by giving critical uh, access hospitals, which operate in rural areas with often very limited capacity, by giving them the flexibility uh, for how they're paid for these services, our intention was to expand access to mental health services, obviously a critical need, but particularly critical in underserved communities. Given the demonstrated need for mental health services across the home, my home state of Michigan, I was really happy to see this notion, this bill, in a sense, advance, not through Congress, but instead through the rulemaking process uh, at the Centers for Medicaid uh, Medicare and Medicaid services. Uh, under their calendar year 2023 hospital out outpatient prospective payment system final rule, CMS acknowledged that allowing this policy to expire would have created harm for patients in underserved communities uh, and choose to extend, they chose to extend it beyond the pandemic. So, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I'm getting it right, Merotra. Um, I wonder if you might just speak to the importance of this particular aspect, this particular policy toward increasing access to mental health services in our communities that have great need. Obviously, mental health is often overlooked as a, as a part of the overall health picture. We try to make some progress in this space, and we think that the idea that we promoted is having some value. I'd like to make it permanent, but I wonder if you might just comment on how this impacts overall health. No, I think that, uh Obviously, the mental health needs uh, in, in the communities, uh, in particular in rural communities, is really uh, enormous uh, problem. And often what we find is one of the things I think is really important to emphasize is that these kinds of technologies bring up a new model in the sense there's often a lot of upfront investment that you need to fixed costs to set up that technology. And sometimes the economics don't work as well in rural communities because you just have fewer patients. And I might give, not related to mental health, but another example which is, uh, came up earlier, which is stroke care. We find that acute telestroke in rural hospitals, is that's where it's most effective, but we see it's the least likely to be used. And what do we hear from chief financial officers in rural communities is that the economics aren't working because of this issue of fixed costs being so substantial. So we need to think a little bit about how we make those investments in rural communities because we might need to pay more or give them that uh, resources to be able to implement these really necessary technologies. Well, I'm glad you raised that because my other question really has to do with what we learned during the pandemic, the flexibilities that we provided, how that impacted underserved communities and what other, I mean, obviously the telehealth access to, uh, to mental health care was one, but are there other sort of uh, innovations that occurred, and I'd offer this to any of the panelists, that during the pandemic that we, we learned enough about that we ought to make sure we extend them and absent some action, we may not be able to do so. Any thoughts on that subject? So, you know, thinking about hospital at home, I think is a really big one. And, and kind of the question was brought up a minute ago about nursing and nursing shortages. And one of the great things about hospital at home is we do a ton of virtual nursing care and, and can utilize, you know, community paramedics in the home, you know, so a trained EMT who can be the nurse's hands and feet to take care of the patient while the nurse does their work remotely. And so, you know, that would be a big one that, again, could have a lot of broader impact. Thank you. I, I really appreciate this panel. Uh, thanks for your input. Uh, this has been a very good hearing. I, I want to thank all the witnesses. And, and I forgot to mention, Mr. Underhill, you're from Saxpaha. If you ever go to the Saxpaha General Store, make sure to say hi to my cousin Jeff, who owns and runs it. <laughs> Ms. Fishbach. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you all for being here um, sincerely, and I appreciate all of the information. And just so you know, I represent a very rural district, biggest town, 50,000. My folks drive hours for medical care, and so I really, really appreciate the at-home and the telehealth. And I'm just wondering, and as we talk a little bit about, you know, Mr. Kilday was asking a little bit about, you mentioned, um, community paramedics and the and uh, Ms. Tenney was talking about the shorting uh, staffing shortages and, uh, and Mr. Underhill you talked about that they're coming to visit and I believe Mrs. Maddox uh, Ms. Maddox you mentioned that they're coming to visit also so I'm just kind of wondering practically how is that are you able to reach those very remote areas 
Um, and, and not that it's not like Alaska. My district isn't like, you know, you have to fly to get somewhere. But I, I am just concerned that when we're talking about, um, you know, several hours worth of drives and things like that, if, if we can utilize it as well as we should be able to. Uh, Ms. Dr. Starr, if you want to start, any of them, any of yeah. them. That, that's a huge challenge. Um, and what we're looking at doing is, is again, utilizing every resource we can find. So if there are EMTs that are available, we will look at that. It, we partner closely with home health and we will utilize home health nursing, you know, who, who are in that geography. Um, and even have had discussions with some of our rural hospitals as they have waxing and waning patient volumes, using some of the inpatient nurses as a way to keep them busier and not call them off, but have them possibly go do some of that work as well. So it's really identifying every resource we can and, and utilizing it as best as possible. Okay, and, and practically, um I mean, are you able to go in and set up? I, you know, Mr. Underhill talked about how they came in when he was getting out of the hospital. They came in, uh, set up the internet, the whole bit, and uh, so they that. Yeah. So we we actually send patients home with a lot of that, and then walk them through the setup at home in that situation. So we give them, we test all the equipment, we make sure everything's working correctly, and then they will leave and take that home, and we will help them set it up at home. Okay. Has has um. And maybe some somewhere along the line it was mentioned, but is the issue um, of of solid broadband? Have you run into that? I mean, where they're we're having issues with that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And we we can always, you know, for hospital at home, for example, we can take care of the patient in the hospital. We have a safe place, so we make sure before we send them home that we have the right connectivity, whether that's really stable Wi-Fi or cellular coverage. Typically, cellular coverage for for most of our areas. And then, and, and to any of the um, members of the panel, um, what are kind of the parameters for determining if someone qualifies for in-home care or at home or how it, whatever the hospital at home, whatever the, the term is, um, I mean, does it vary with every single um, diagnosis or how is that, how do you determine if they are able to use this? Yeah, it really comes down to, we look at the care the patient needs to get better, what they would get in the hospital, can we provide that in the home? So we, we've gone through all our diagnoses and what it takes to take care of those and make sure that we can actually provide an equivalent level of care. So and you then, have maybe a, a chart that you're saying, yeah, okay, really this and, and age and ability. And then, and then some patients fall outside that and then we'll huddle as a team and decide, can we actually take care of them safely? And if the answer is no, they stay in the hospital. If yes, we'll take them home. Okay. And and Ms. Maddox and Mr. Underhill, I, I know that you talked a little bit about your experience, you know, during your opening statements. And I'm just curious. And 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 I got the impression that it was positive. Um, that, <laughs> that both of you had positive experiences. Was there anything that that either could be improved or? And I guess I only have 46. I, I have so many questions, but uh, it could be improved or that. Um, that was helpful, uh, I guess, maybe just commenting on that. I, I, I'm just kind of curious if you felt it was like something. I, I, I was so enthusiastic, I really didn't have anything to, to improve it. Uh, I, I cannot think of a thing. It, okay. it just worked flawlessly for me. Oh, I appreciate that. Okay, yeah. that's very good. I mean, I would say that a potential barrier for some other patients, well, including myself, where there's there's a heavy utilization on your electric bill and water bill. Um, garbage pickup is a big thing. And I think that for a lot of people that might be a barrier because they wouldn't want to see those increase in costs uh, weigh on their family. And so that, that would definitely be something that could be improved. Yeah, and, and I, I know I only have a couple, well, I'm over time, but I suppose I, when you mentioned that, I hadn't even thought of that, that that's not covered. That's something that's not covered. You bear those those costs yourself, so. Well, thank you very much, and I really appreciate all of you being here, and I am looking forward to um, really expanding what we have because it is so important to folks like in my district, but not only that, I think the health of people, I think Mr. Underhill said it, and, and Mrs. Maddox, you said it too, that it's so much better to be at home, and so I appreciate it. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Tran, I hope I get your name right. I'm not, 
name? Dr. Marotra, yeah. Marotra. Can you describe how the impact of hospital closures in communities will affect the demand for telehealth services? And how can the decrease in medical workforce caused by hospital closures impact the ability to provide telehealth pro, uh, options? Well, thank you, Representative. I, I think you, um, I wanted to emphasize like two sides of that coin. The first is obviously when a hospital closes in a community, patients are gonna have to, when they get care, go much farther to the nearest hospital. And I think it really, some of the technologies we've described today can really facilitate those patients from getting, uh, getting that care that they need. The other side that I wanted to emphasize that your question raises, which is that can telehealth keep rural hospitals from closing? because there is the possibility that we bring a lot of that technology for stroke care, for mental health care, sepsis care, et cetera, to rural hospitals and allow them to care for a broader range of patients and conditions and allow them the finances and so forth to stay open. So I also do want to emphasize that aspect where telehealth can keep rural hospitals from closing. Studies have shown that increased access to telehealth services increase accessibility for communities of color. Can you please elaborate for communities explicitly why disparities in health equity are reduced when telehealth services are made available? Yeah, I think the, what we're finding in some of our data, and we, we obviously this has been a theme of the work that we've done, is, is that we have the concern that when we introduce these new technologies, we often see that if we just offer it to everybody, it can increase disparities of care. And that's one of the greatest concerns I have, and I think many of the other folks, uh, the witnesses share. And so the real question is, is that how do we target our investments, resources, reimbursement to those communities so that we don't widen disparities, but rather reduce them, which is what we all want. Like, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. I know it's a long day and for taking the time to testify. My home state of West Virginia is about as rural as you can get. And there are so many patients that have to drive up to five hours to get medical t care. Either they're driving it themselves or their caretaker takes them just to get the care that they need. Um, that's what makes home health care so important. And where clinically appropriate, it's an absolute game changer for my constituents. The technology available today makes it common sense to me that we try and make healthcare available to patients in their own home where they're most comfortable. This not only helps patients access care more easily, but it also lessens the burden that the caretakers have, uh, you know, uh, having a job outside of their own loved ones you know, having to take care of them. It won a group of patients that I work particularly close with and are those with end-stage renal disease. Patients with ESRD typically have to dialyze at least three times a week just to manage their disease. In rural America, that can amount to hours upon hours. It can take your whole day, really, because you're traveling back and forth. You spend three or four hours doing it. And, you know, it's hard. It's exhausting. That's why I'm such an advocate for home dialysis. The ability for patients to dialyze at home reduces that burden of travel, and it allows the patients to work a full-time job if they want to, or go to school and still manage their own health care. Ms. Maddox, I'm a mother and a grandmother, and I know what it's like to have your hands full and your darling children, but I didn't have any health problems like you have and the complications and hearing your testimony and how you juggled being a mother and having a full-time job and having to commute three times a week just to receive your dialysis is extraordinary to me because I know what it was like not having a problem. And I'm sorry that that was your reality. I applaud your strength and the grace that you have shown and how you've been taking care of your own health as well as your family simultaneous. And I see them there back there shaking their heads. As a patient who dialyzed in center and now at home, can you compare the experiences 
Tell us what was most difficult about making the transition to dialyzing at home. Um, being in center, uh, as I mentioned, there were many different parts of it that was very difficult. Uh, a lot of the patients, they were very ill and sort of didn't want to <laughs> didn't want to be there. So um, the experience of going to in center uh, compared to going at home, the impact on your emotional health and your mental health is um, indescribable, and you can't really calculate that. Um, and I also think that um, having that emotional impact and that mental health impact does have an impact on your health as well. Um, when you feel better about what you're doing, you feel better. <laughs> um, and so with being at home, um, I was able to see an improvement in my health, health from that standpoint. Um, and then there was also the sense of autonomy and control that you regain of your own life. And that also has a, a positive impact on how you're feeling about things and, and how you feel. So that, that transition um, has multi, um, multiple aspects of it that were an improvement on my life. And, and even your disposition, because you're, you're not feeling guilty and you're, you're more at ease of being in control of something that you weren't in control of, um, especially with the little ones that you, you don't have to take that deep breath before you answer because you're, you're cool and you're calm. I'm working on a bill with Congressman Blumenauer that aims to increase access to home dialysis by providing trained professional staff assistant to patients in their home. And the bill will ensure that all patients are given the education and the support that they need to utilize home dialysis if they so choose. I'm glad to hear that staff training helped you to be able to dialyze at home. And I'm hopeful that my bill will help provide coverage for these services to more ESRD patients. Ms. Maddox, share what your experience was like navigating Medicare coverage for your training and dialysis at home. It was definitely a huge learning experience for me and uh, a lot that I had to learn on the fly and through trial and error. Um, I learned that Medicare is uh, required for people who are in dialysis for a period of time. So even though I maintained my health care coverage and my main health care, my, sorry, my main insurance coverage through my employer, um, I was still required to have Medicare. Um, and then I learned that I content had to, you know, pay a premium um, for that coverage, um, even though it wasn't my, it, it wasn't my choice. Um, I also learned that I had to maintain that coverage in order to stay active on a uh, transplant waiting list. Um, so it, these are all things that I had to figure out as I went. Um, there is a financial coordinator that's available, but she was, wasn't, <clears throat> excuse me, she wasn't able to help me with filing paperwork, visiting the SSA office, waiting in line, um, being online on the telephone to just get all of that sorted out. So it's a difficult experience, but I understand why I had to do it. And it had to have been scary, had to have been. And then for you to finally reach that, again, that deep breath of, okay, I'm just gonna follow through and get this done. I, I just thank you for your answers and for sharing your, your story and your family and, and I hope to introduce the Improving Access to Home Dialysis Act very soon to help patients access this at home. And Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Panetta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Feenstra, for letting me go real quick. Uh, but thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing, and thanks to all the witnesses. Um, this hearing, for me, really highlights a number of issues that affect my constituents. In California's 19th Congressional District, we face a convergence of high health care costs, provider scarcity, and a high rate of government insurance, all of which have really kind of created a perfect storm for providers and for patients and pushed access out of reach for many people that I represent. That's why I have repeatedly, be it in this committee room or outside of it, raised the issue of costs which stretch providers that impact care, health care, in my district. Now, Mr. Alchek, in your testimony, you stated that Medicare reimbursement or remote patient monitoring, RPM reimbursement, based on geography, I think you said something to the effect of it's antiquated, 
but you also said it disincentivizes the adoption of home health services, especially in rural areas where payments are lower. You go on to say, though, that your services have led to a 23% average decrease in a cost of care. So, Mr. Olchek, have Medicare payment limits kept pace with these savings? And as seniors make up a larger share of the population, how do you see telehealth, home health, and RPM services playing a role in the growth of Medicare? Congressman Panetta, thank you for the question. I think there's two important policy considerations on Medicare. First is uh, reimbursement rates for remote monitoring broadly have declined 28% since they were introduced in 2018. 2018. That's compared to a 9% decrease in broader Medicare rates via the conversion factor. If we want a healthcare future that's modern, we need to invest in it. Number two, um, reimbursement in rural communities is substantially lower, 20 to 30% lower than it is in urban communities uh, because of the geographic differences. The, the cost to deliver the service is equal, whether it's in a rural community or an urban community, and, and we should just fix that. It's common sense policy. And then number three, to your, to your, to your point about how, what role this plays, um, we have a dramatic access challenge today, as you mentioned, um, in your district. Um, that problem's only getting worse and exponentially worse given the rapid increase in uh, an elderly population in the U.S. that's very chronically ill. So, so we have no choice but to embrace these technologies. Now, obviously, when it comes to providers, my constituents, like I said, are facing a shortage. And the failure of Medicare to keep up with the cost of care, including the fact that Medicare Advantage payment rates for home health care have dropped by nearly a third, combined with the high cost of living, especially in my district, and the high rate of government payer patients, all make it harder year after year to recruit and to retain a health care workforce. Now, when it comes to care by providers, either at the office or by home, we need to work to ensure that Medicare is paying a substantial rate, but also that providers are maintaining standards of care. Mr. Alchek, how can CMS establish better measures to ensure patients continue to receive quality care under home health so we know that Medicare's investment is actually leading to better patient outcomes? Yeah, it's a great question, and I think the opportunity here is, is actually not to, to meet the existing standard of care, but what we're trying to do is elevate the standard of care, and I think we can do a dramatically better job in the U.S., especially with outcomes for patients with chronic disease. Um, the metrics that matter, uh, you know, the good thing is that the CMS in the new uh, shared savings metrics is really focused on a few key goals, A1C control, blood pressure control. We, we know the metrics that matter. I think all the physicians are, are aligned there. The question is, can we do a much better job of getting patients to control, which uh, the technology shows that it's able to do that. I hope so. Um, I got to go vote. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I yield back. I now recognize uh, Representative uh, Bethendine. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. With over 800,000 people living with end-stage renal disease, which requires patients to undergo dialysis to survive, since their kidneys can no longer filter their blood and remove toxins on their own, the patients need to be treated for roughly three to five hours at a medical facility, or they can opt to do home analysis four to seven times per week. Every step possible must be taken to allow a patient to get this life-saving um, organ quickly and safely. So last June, I introduced the Saving Organs One Flight at a Time Act, which requires the TSA and FAA to issue regulations that would offer common sense reforms to improve the air transportation of human organs. As um, after September 11th, uh, 2001, the terrorist attacks in our nation, the ability for human organs to fly above the wings in commercial aircrafts was removed, causing organs to fly in the cargo hold, which has created confusion, delays, and even the destruction of these organs. And that's why I'm also working to introduce a bill that would add the ability to automatically refer donors to organ procurement organizations, which should lead to the increased chance of a successful donation. I look forward to introducing this bill in the next coming weeks and working across the aisle to help patients in need. We have had a lot of people who've asked you questions. A lot of them have been multiple questions. When you get all the way down to the end of the dais and you've got like freshman members of this committee, we're looking over our questions and like that's been asked like five times. So while I do have a number of questions that I could ask and make you all repeat yourselves, what I would prefer to do is at this point in time, what are some of the points that you feel like haven't been made that you'd like to respond to that you perhaps didn't have an opportunity to respond to? And Mrs. Maddox, I'm going to ask you um, to, to go ahead and go first. 
Thank you so much for asking that, and also thank you so much for your work. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, one thing that we haven't covered is uh, trained staff. And a lot of the issues that we talked about with, um, for example, uh, you know, traveling, a uh, healthcare provider traveling a long distance to get to their patient. If we had more people uh, and more staff who were trained in these modalities, um, I think that that would solve a lot of those issues. With the home dialysis training uh, facility that I am working from, there's only one person um, who's doing the training and all the administrative work. But I think that uh, outside of you know innovations in technology and outside of um, the other areas that we've discussed today, um, one thing that we we haven't touched on is just training and having more uh, prepared and well trained staff to facilitate these different modalities. Excellent, Mr. Underhill. I was asked earlier uh, the cost of this treatment relative to cost in the hospital, and I have, as a patient, of course, I have no idea. Uh, so the lack of transparency, lack of ability to get that information is, uh, is a concern to me. All right, Dr. Starr. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, <clears throat> the, the point that came to mind was one that uh, was br briefly mentioned before, and that's the ability of these telehealth and hospital at home programs to keep care and revenue for that care locally within some of these facilities and hospitals that are struggling so much financially. Um, you know, every patient that we keep locally is revenue that can then support the overall facility and benefit every member of that community. Excellent, thank you. Uh, very quickly, I believe American healthcare is desperately in need of more innovation, uh, and I can't underestimate uh, or understate the role that policymakers have in enabling that to happen. Uh, obviously, it's a bipartisan issue, uh, but the support from uh, Congress makes a meaningful difference in these technologies becoming a reality. Anything in particular, though? Medicare reimbursement sets the tone for Medicaid, for commercial, uh, and so making sure Medicare reimbursement is aligned with where, with your vision for where healthcare should go is, is, is where we need to focus. Other than just though adding additional dollars, which is typically what, when folks come to our office, that's what they ask for. Is there anything? I, I think that the, the big one is, is actually not adding additional dollars. It's, it's, it's uh, making sure the, the geographic adjustment factor for Medicare uh, takes into consideration the fact that technology costs the same, whether it's in a rural community or an urban community, and I think we need to fix that going forward to make sure that uh, we level the playing field between, uh, between these communities. Excellent, thank you. I want to build off one point that uh, Dr. Starr made before, which is about licensure. Um, I don't know, uh, Ms. Maddox, is, uh, you're currently listed at three transplant centers, you said, and for patients in your position to go to uh, clinicians who are in different states is very, very difficult right now because of the licensure rules. And so this is a major barrier to care for patients who want to get the care, the specialty care that they need, because the clinician in the other state can't care for them in their home state. So any reforms in that area Excellent. would be critical. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, now I recognize myself. I want to thank the the panel, uh, for, the, for all that you've said and, and, and what you're working on, I want to thank uh, Ms. Maddox uh, for your comments. Truly inspiring, especially when you have children. I have children too, and the challenges, you know, just being a mom and then also dealing with your health. And same thing with Mr. Underhill. Uh, thanks for, for your comments and your thoughts and, and what we can do better. And that's what I want to address. So I'm from rural Iowa. I have 36 counties. And this is probably the number one issue right now is uh, rural access to care. And I see this on an ongoing basis from EMS to maternal health care to just uh, finding a, a, a doctor, a clinic uh, to take care of patients. And so this is really outside of the box thinking. I think of Dr. Starr, Mr. Uh, uh, Alchuk, what you're talking about is normalizing this type of care when it comes to telehealth, when it comes to hospital at home, when it comes to dialysis at home. But the problem is when you, when you really step it down to rural, all right, there's a disconnect, all right? Because I do hear about it. I hear from our hospitals if we could do more of X, what, what you're just doing. So Mr. Starr, Mr., uh, Dr. Mr. Mr. Alchek, what are solutions to getting it to that next level? I get it, Medicare, Medicaid are, are, are big problems, but it just seems like there's still a disconnect 
to creating the solution of what we want to normalize this care. Where's your thoughts on that? Yeah, part, part of it is just time. It is still so new. Like somebody mentioned, you know, we, we had 10 years of innovation and 18 months during the pandemic. And I think everyone is still catching up to that and, and recognizing that this, it, it is pretty revolutionary what we're trying to do with care compared to what's been done the last 50 years. So part of it is getting comfortable with it. But um, part of it is, is also having health systems and you know, overall as a society recognize that you know, some of this care is needed, it's transformative. The return on investment's gonna be there, but it's not gonna be for 20 years. That's right, it, it, it's innovative, but it, the return on investment, but that's what we gotta look at, the return on investment. Uh, Mr. Alchek. I would just say the, the, the thing that we found to be successful is uh, engaging local primary care doctors. We work with 800 local primary care doctors in rural and underserved communities. They want to do what's best for the patients. When given the technology, they adopt it. Uh, the issue is how do we get the technology in their hands with a business model that they can support. Uh, but if we do that, the, the demand is there, as, as you mentioned and, and you see in your, yep. in your district. Yep. Well, well, thank you for that. Um, I have to go vote, but I'd like to, I'll yield back, but I'd like to thank the witnesses for appearing here today. Uh, Okay, I guess we're going to recess then. So the committee will, re will take a brief recess and we'll be back shortly.
The committee will come to order. Thank you all. We had to do something called voting on the House floor, and we worked that through. Um, we'll go to Dr. Murphy. Thank you guys uh, for your patience today. This is our world, and it's insane. Why did I leave medicine, right? Why did I leave medicine to join this insanity? Well, it's because our country and medicine is, um, is a mess. So anyway, thank you all for coming. I, I had a specific question I wanted to ask. Um, First, what happened to our lady on the left? Did she leave? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask her when she comes back. Um, I, I want to ask, I, I guess, Dr. Uh, pardon me, Matrova, Morova, Morotra. There we go. Thank you. Sorry. I was reading your testimony in here, and I actually had asked Dr. Ferguson if I were not here to do this. I wanted to follow up on some of the studies and some of the statements that you made in your testimony. I, uh, I ran a, a surgical practice for many years until I literally had to resign just to join Congress. Um, and uh, I was the one who was there at Saturday night at two o'clock counting the paper clips to make sure that we saved as much money to make payroll. Our payer mix is 74% government, um, Medicare, Medicaid, no insurance, and so literally to survive, we had to make sure that payments were done and um, we saved money where we could. I, I was reading in here when you were talking about telemedicine, which telemedicine is critical for where I practice because I see patients two hours north, two hours south, and sometimes five hours um, out east. It was absolutely a lifesaver, and I mean literally a lifesaver during the pandemic to be able to do this. I, uh, I fully believe that we should not step down in any of this because in rural America, we want, first of all, everybody doesn't have gas money to get out to see physicians and it is absolutely critical. Um, I don't believe the doc on the, on the clock kind of thing, on the video thing, spitting out uh, weight loss medicines is, uh, is good medicine. I believe it's absolutely poor medicine. But I wanna go back to one of the things you said. I know maybe Dr. Ferguson brought it up that you recommended payment for telehealth visits to be less than in person. Let me tell you what that would do to a practice, to a private practice. It would absolutely decimate it because patients want it, and I believe it's an absolute wonderful thing. If I'm seeing a patient back who's had a prostatectomy and they're coming back for a PSA visit, that's absolutely a wonderful thing to do to save them. You know, it could be two hours on one end, two hours back. But there's capital, there's an investment in a building, there's an investment in, um, uh, in your nursing staff, in your malpractice and everything. None of that goes away. And you've also invested 30, I, I invested now 35 years of my life in medicine with not only academia, but expertise in the field. To say to Medicare, to say to insurance companies that that value of the knowledge that I deliver is less just because I'm on a screen rather than talking to somebody in person is wrong. It's absolutely a, a flawed because those expenses still go. And if we want to be able to, in this, in this world of a shortage of physicians, which is not getting any better, recent studies showed that 63% of medical students do not plan on practicing clinical medicine. Our medical schools are doing an absolute failing job in delivering people into a workforce that is now terribly short. But then to then push people into further debt so that they close their private practices and either retire or go into um, hospital employment, which I know for a fact is less quality medicine, is absolutely wrong. So I, I just have to say that. It, I don't care what studies show, because these studies were done, done outside of any real world medicine, that this is, this is factually inaccurate. Okay, I just, I, ha I have to say that. This, I speak from a real world. Um, I take care of people that don't look like I do, and the expenses that how many times I did not take a paycheck because we couldn't answer the expenses or, or couldn't come with the expenses. Now with the United Healthcare debacle, this is literally, um, while they get to keep their money and they're making money on their money, um, this is absolutely wrong. So uh, I, I just have to, to bring that out. We, we can't practice medicine and CMS is doing this. It also, it absolutely countermands the whole great gift we have of telemedicine. I would not do it if you're gonna lose money on it. Why would you do that? 
Why would you do that? You want to, you want to put something through. I just want to say, uh, uh, Mr. Underhill, um, I'm glad that experience worked out well for you. Um, I, I'm a little wary. Is, are we only talking about literally IV antibiotics and vital sign monitoring when people go home? Because you're surely not going to give patient-instructed narcotics or any type of uh, cardiac medication. Are you guys talking about doing anything else? Yeah, so um, pretty, we can do a pretty broad range of therapies safely. Narcotics are a huge issue, and we, we don't do any IV narcotics. Uh, we do some limited oral. But it, it, IV diuresis, um, you know, a variety of infectious treatments, IV fluids, you know, symptom control, you know, uh, nausea, and so forth, we can all do. Yeah, I, you know, I think of people coming in with a caster, catheter who are um, in retention and having post-obstructive diuresis. If, if they can literally just drink, um, they're in a good spot to be at home. I'm a big fan of this. It just has to be, we have to know the conditions into which we're delivering our patients and have to understand that remuneration models are going to be critical. This cannot cost the system uh, more than what it's uh, costing now because we're, we're on a pathway to, you know, a desert with our money right now. So I thank you all for doing this. It's, a, it's way too, uh, too late and it's past its time, but with, now with the technology that we have, it's going to be a lifesaver and it's going to hopefully cost a lot of people money. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you. Mr. Moore? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for holding this important hearing today to hear from patients, providers, and stakeholders on innovative ways to bring care to patients at their home. This is particularly important as Congress considers the expiring Medicare telehealth flexibilities and the hospital at home waiver this year. I'm excited to welcome Dr. Nathan Starr from Intermountain, Intermountain Health today to speak to their work in expanding patients' access to care in particularly rural and underserved areas. Intermountain is a Utah-based healthcare system and yet another illustration of how Utah leads the nation in finding innovative and outcomes-based solutions to our various communities' challenges. My team and I have heard from several folks back home, ranging from the Rural Health Association of Utah to primary and specialty care providers, about how telehealth flexibilities and the hospital at home waiver are enhancing their ability to provide care to patients from St. George to Logan and everywhere in between. And, and, and this is a, an important discussion today because, you know, as miserable as the pandemic was and confusing as it was for people, like, you look in the business community and, 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 and folks were able to find certain avenues and, and, and lanes to play in that they could be more flexible. Uh, and you know, we got through it. And I think we need to make sure that healthcare is doing the same. We came up with opportunities. Dr. Starr, you and I have spoken. I got four young kids. My wife's very busy, especially with me being gone so much, like finding these telehealth opportunities for, for ailments or conditions that could, could be solved if, the, if she has the flexibility to, 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 to do this. I mean, there's real work that can be done here. To my, to, to my colleague from North Carolina, doing it right, doing it safe is key. And I know that Intermountain and, the, and many of the others um, are focused on that. Uh, Dr. Starr, Intermountain has several telehealth programs aimed at expanding access to specialty care in rural areas of the state and throughout the Intermountain West region. Can you discuss what those programs look like for patients as well as how you balance in-person versus virtual care? Yeah, thanks for that question. The, the feedback we've gotten from patients has been really positive. And having done a lot of virtual care myself, it is really fun to be able to tell a patient, if we brought you up to our quaternary center in Salt Lake City, I would take care of you. And I am telling you, we can do the exact same things we would do here, down there, you're gonna get the exact same care. Um, and that, that is incredibly reassuring. The, the other thing we see all the time is many of these patients who live in rural areas don't want to leave. Um, we've heard many times, I would rather die than go up there and, and have to deal with all that. Um, and so the fact that we can care for them where they are in place is, is hugely powerful and, and impactful. And would you say that it encourages folks to be more involved in their health care if it's more easily accessible? Oh, definitely. All right, and we all talk about the importance of preventative health care, right? And getting out ahead of issues become they, before they come catastrophic or before you're in an ER. And, you know, I view this as an opportunity to continue to double down or double our efforts to, to encourage patients. It's a change, right? You know, providers can do everything they can, but patients and, and we have to change. The society has to change, and we have to be more willing to. And if it's a, And if that barrier... Is safe and lower for us to get that care. It's 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 key. You know, we've talked also 
On the other side of the coin is the workforce shortages in healthcare, uh, especially in rural and underserved areas. How can telehealth um, or remote patient monitoring expand the capacity for rural facilities to serve more patients? Yeah, we, we've seen some great examples of that. Um, some have been mentioned, you know, with uh, remote patient monitoring allowing a provider to see more patients. Um, additionally, we, we've done a lot of work with nursing um, and providing not only, you know, tele-support for physicians and patients, but actually having a nurse program where inexperienced nurses can reach out and, and get support if, if they're not sure how to manage a patient. Again, trying to, to make them as, as comfortable as possible and, and improve their job as much as we can. Mr. Alchek, anything to add to that? I, I think your emphasis on preventative medicine is key, and what we found is when patients actually start checking their vitals regularly and knowing that there's a nurse on the other side seeing the results, uh, they take a lot more personal accountability for their care. So I, I think you're exactly right. This is not only a technology opportunity, but it's an opportunity to get patients more invested in their own health, uh, which, which will have dramatic impact. Members of this committee are obviously uh, very interested in ensuring taxpayers Dollars are utilized uh, properly. You know, we're the stewards of Medicare's program finances, make sure that healthcare services improve patient outcomes. Uh, Dr. Starr, just lastly, as we wrap up, can you talk about how Intermountain measures the value and quality of telehealth for other, uh, or other at-home services? How does, this, how does this differ from in-person care for similar services? Yeah, the, the way we measure it is, is really, we don't look at revenue we bring in at all. It is all about cost savings which makes it challenging. Our telehealth program runs in the red significantly if you just look at net operating income. But when we look at that value we create and the costs that we save in terms of transfers, keeping patients in their community, improved outcomes, we, the value is there. Excellent. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you to the patients, providers, everyone. Uh, appreciate your, your thoughtful testimony today. And um, know that we're all partners here to try to, to get costs to a point where they're not so difficult for our constituents um, and find solutions like this and you all are, are very much working on it. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank our witnesses for appearing before us today and also um, point out that Ms. Maddox, our witness, um, had to actually leave early to do her dialysis. So that's how important um, this hearing is all about. But um, please be advised that members have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. With that, the committee stands adjourned.